Okay, I think we're um, 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 set from um, the uh, microphone and logistics and administrative perspective. So first, I want to thank everybody for joining this afternoon um, for this session on um, public innovation and pandem pandemic preparedness. Um, some of you know that we've actually been meeting for almost a day and a half where we've discussed some fairly big uh, policy issues. Um, and we wanted to continue that discussion um, in this afternoon session and to actually talk about some of the innovative things. There's some challenges to pandemic preparedness for sure, but we also want to talk, also want to talk about some of the innovations that the community is bringing to bear to help solve some of these really pressing global challenges. And so with that, I am going to uh, turn this session over um, to Dr. Scott Littlebridge, who is a longtime friend and colleague um, who's been working in this space for quite some time. And just to share a personal anecdote, Scott and I first um, met each other back in the uh, mid to yeah, maybe mid, mid 1990s when our nation first began to get very, very concerned about the threat of bioterrorism. And at the time, Scott was took on the responsibility for establishing the CDC's first ever bioterrorism preparedness program. I happened to be the commander of USAMRID, the laboratory at, at Fort Detrick, and we have forged a bond ever since then uh, of, of working on hard problems. And as it turned out over the years, it seems like whenever there was a disaster, be it an emerging infectious diseases, um, even a hurricane, somehow uh, Scott and I were involved. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll turn um, the podium over to Dr. Littlebridge who will introduce our, our panelists and our speakers and give you a little bit of idea of the, the battle rhythm for this afternoon. So Scott. Thank you, Thank you Jerry. I uh, appreciate that. Um, the mission today was uh, to reinvigorate the afternoon to make sure we weren't losing steam at the end of the second day. Uh, I have a few things to sort of stack up. First of all, um, I, I listened the last two days and always learned a little bit, even though I'm advanced station in life and uh, well into my career. Um, I want to thank uh, Mike Ostrom for reminding us, uh, sounding the alarm. Um, Mike's been doing that for a long time, uh, spurred us into action, and I'll give you more examples of that later. Uh, Peter Navarro, who said, uh, wanted us to realize that there were problems that required cooperation on an international stage. And uh, that's indeed true when you get into scale, size, logistics, and dealing with uh, multinational responses. And Andy Card, who had a, a practical uh, word of advice, uh, having been in a leadership position, he said it's important for people like us in these collective uh, adventures and ultimately in leadership positions to be able to frame problems and solutions in words that can be understandable and implemented. Um, a lot of us in academia have circular discussions that go on, uh, but uh, that's great advice in terms of um, pandemic preparedness and so forth. Um, let me give you a kind, of a, a kind of a snapshot of how far we've come. Uh, almost 20 years ago today, I opened uh, the doors on the Public Health Preparedness Program at CDC. It was $129 million. That was a lot of money in those days. And um, it was more money than I thought I'd ever manage. And uh, uh, it was only the beginning. However, at, at that time, uh, we thought of preparedness as national primarily. And this program was largely focused on the United States. It, it did some things right, and that was to build infrastructure and surveillance, uh, uh, infectious disease, uh, laboratory capacities, training, education, and epidemiology, and so forth. And we worked with state and locals at a local level to implement infrastructure over time. We developed a critical agents list. Some people in this room were on the, those meetings to develop the first list of potential threats. And uh, we were greeted, uh, greeted by our colleagues uh, with um, uh, advice that maybe we should get a real job and that we should think about things that were more practical and fast forward um, into discussions and forums like this where we're talking about pandemic preparedness, emerging infectious disease, uh, health security, and, and so forth on a global scale. 
uh, I say, my, how far we've come. Which brings us to uh, the charge of this panel, uh, and this is one of the best panels I've been with in a very long time, is that uh, this panel is to focus on uh, and give our speakers a chance to talk about innovation in the preparedness space, particularly as it relates to infectious disease and other things related to development in the humanitarian sector. The important thing for us today was to talk about challenges that uh, were some of the major things that were yet undone and to propose some innovative approaches, programs, technologies, or solutions to address those. And that's, I think that's what we'll do today. Uh, we're going to try to get out by 3.15, so I'll be fairly abrupt at 3.15. Sorry, panelists. Uh, but, uh, and uh, I'll ask some questions, and we'll have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, again, I need to remind people this is not Chatham House rules, that anything you say is open to the media, the press, or anybody else that wants to ask a question or quote you uh, accurately or, or otherwise. And uh, so be it. Uh, so let me introduce our first speaker and get on with getting on here. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dennis Carroll, who currently serves as director for the U.S. Agency for International Development uh, for Global Health Security and Development Unit. Uh, in this position, he's responsible for providing strategic and operational leadership to the agency programs that address new and emerging disease threats. And I will tell you, over the past 10 to 15 years, that has been a busy outfit. He has also been USAID's special representative to global health security initiatives, and uh, he was formerly with the United States uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, back in those days, it might have been called CDC. I don't know how far you go back, but I go back to CDC before it was the disease and prevention. And uh, he has, has a doctorate in biomedical research, and uh, I will just tell you, uh, he asked me to really embellish this, and uh, he's a fun guy. Uh, he has a lot of interesting hobbies. He knows many people here, and, uh, and when it comes to uh, late night conversation, he's the best. Anyway, Dennis, <laughs> if you'd give him a hand. Good, thank you. Well, first of all, turn down the lights. It's a late night conversation. Um, uh, this is, this is going to be the best part of, I mean, I think the next two hours is going to be the best part of, I think, the discussion we've had over the last day, because it is talking about thinking differently. It's about thinking about old problems and thinking about new ways of dealing with problems. In the last uh, day and a half, we've been talking about problems. Uh, there are challenges out there. I think we're all mindful of those challenges. Uh, and we've had some measured success sort of dealing with uh, those problems, but we also know it's a long road to hoe, that uh, the challenges we're facing with are demanding that we think differently. And Mike opened up that conference with uh, a quote from none other than Albert. Um, and if we're going to think innovatively, creatively, I think he, he did a nice job in terms of highlighting that to regard old problems from a new angle requires creative imagination. So I'm going to ask everyone to put their imagination hat on because we're going to talk about, I'm going to present to you one approach, innovative approach to dealing with an old problem. As we have this discussion, others are going to chime in and offer some additional ones. But I have the opportunity to talk in greater detail, uninterrupted, um, about a, a particular approach to dealing with the problem that we have. And it's basically about making the unknown known. We had a lot of discussions about known viruses and the challenges that, whether it's MERS or SARS or um, Ebola, we know about these. And we haven't necessarily done a good job in being responsive to them, but we're getting better at those. But there is this vast dark matter out there of the unknown viruses. And in some way, we have to begin to change the paradigm, which is not waiting for an unknown virus to become known, and then we begin scrambling to react to it. In some way, we need to be figuring out how we can make the unknown known before they become a problem. 
And what I'm going to be talking about is the opportunity we have in terms of making the unknown known, doing it by mapping the global virome. Basically, recognizing that we're in a unique space at this point in time where the technologies, the science, and the infrastructure we have allows us to begin thinking about going out and making that unknown known. And we'll talk about that. So, but this is the problem, and we talked a lot about this over the last day and a half. We're not really prepared to deal with the threats posed by emerging viral diseases. And we talked about this really in two streams. We have Mother Nature sort of periodically uh, challenging us with new viral diseases, whether it's H7N9 or Ebola. We have shown ourselves not to have done as good a job as we could. And we also are moving into a unique space in human history where gain of function research and science is allowing us to create new variants of viruses, and whether accidentally or intentionally, they can also become part of our landscape. And one way or another, we have to think differently about these dual threats because the 21st century is unlike any century we've been in before. And it's largely because of one simple reason, population. If we were in this room 100 years ago, go back to 1918, global pandemic, 1.8 billion people on the planet, 7.5 billion people today. Think about it. As a species, 300,000 years before we hit the 1 billion mark, and in the space of one century, we've added another 6 billion people. And by the end of this century, we're going to be right on the edge of 12 billion. We can't, as a species, have that kind of footprint on this planet without changing the fundamental dynamics of the interactive relationship between us and the larger ecosystem. We know that climate change, everything else, but one of the big challenges we have is the fact that in the world around us is a mass pool of viral agents circulating in wildlife and livestock. At some point over the course of this century, we're going to see an increasing frequency with which those viral agents are going to spill over into it. It's a God-given fact they're going to happen. And we have to be better prepared to deal with that onslaught than we have been because the challenges are become more frequent, more intense, and with globalization, the other big dynamic, whatever solace we took in the past of what happens locally stays locally, Ebola should have been a very important wake-up call to everyone. Those things that happened in remote corners of the world in the past no longer stay remote. Everything is 24 hours away. So it's a different space. 21st century is a different time. And we need to be more imaginative about how we think about this problem. So we're going to talk about what we might be able to do. Let me just put a few markers down here. What I'm going to put down here could take up a three-hour discussion. Just bear with me. I'm going to give you some quote-unquote facts because they are the underpinnings for what we're going to talk about. First off, when I talked about viral dark matter, you know, there's about 600 or so viruses that we've encountered over the course um, of our existence as a species. But what we're estimating is that that's less than a tenth of a percent of what's out there that could pose a future risk to human populations. We're estimating, and we've made reasonable estimates, and we can talk about it later, that there are about 1.5 million viruses within 24 viral families that have shown themselves to play themselves out in potentially dangerous ways within human populations that are circulating in wildlife. And we estimate of those one and a half million, probably around 500,000 or so have some potential zoonotic capability. That is, they, they may have the ability to, in fact, infect people. It doesn't say whether they would cause illness or anything else. But there is a vast pool. Whatever 600 or so we've seen to date, be prepared. The 21st century is going to be quite a ride. But what we also know is that uh, we can characterize this vast majority of viruses. 
The fact is we have the technologies, we have the tools, and we have the capability. That, that unknown dark matter can, in fact, be known. We can go out there and capture that information and characterize it and essentially convert the sciences of virology from small, agent-specific, almost mom-and-pop-like ventures. I'm, I focus on Ebola. I focus on Zika. I focus on HIV into big data science. And it's the opportunity to transform the sciences of emerging viral diseases from small science to big data science allows us to think about problems in ways that are unimaginable now as we think about individual agents. And ultimately, that power of transforming the sciences into big data science allows us to move from a reactive to a proactive. We can understand and know risk and threats before, and we can develop approaches and countermeasures in advance and even disrupt the opportunity for those spillover events to occur. It's a fundamental opportunity we've never had before. So what do we need to do that? We need to think differently. And this picture, for those of you from Houston, this is for you. Uh, because this picture went to Houston um, 40 years ago or so, and it was one of those transformative moments for our species where we, for the first time, got a picture not just of the entire planet Earth, but from the planet Earth from a different body in space. Stunning moment in our history. It allowed us to think differently about us as a species within a cosmos. We need to have that same kind of transformative thinking if we're going to effectively really deal with emerging viral threats of the future. So put your imagination hats on, pull them on tight. So solutions. This is mine. Others will have others. But it's being transformative and disruptive. Again, that one and a half million or so viruses circulating out there, the opportunity to gather that information and create essentially a viral atlas that allows us to understand. And you'll see, not just the genetic construct, but the whole viral ecology of future threats, which allows us to think fundamentally different, both about future countermeasure, biomedical countermeasures, and future preventive measures, understanding genetics and understanding viral ecology. And this is what, this is the specific area that I'm talking about. It's the Global Virome Project. This is a, a venture that's underway, um, and we're looking to move this into a global partnership. We're taking steps to move this into the kind of global engagement with global ownership that allows us to transform sort of the global partnership towards understanding viral threats and laying the groundwork for all future opportunities for risk mitigation. So what I'm going to talk about are specific areas of work that a community of science, public health leaders, politicians, um, private sector, uh, and foundation people have come together to begin arcing out a different way of thinking about how we can turn the unknown into the known. And it's fundamentally the first function is to develop a comprehensive viral database. And you'll see I don't know if this is, does it have a, yeah. There are really two lines of data acquisition that we're talking about. By going out into wildlife, going out to those species that harbor these particular viruses, collecting those viruses, and then doing the kind of analysis that first off allows us to look across all viral agents, viral families, and do the deep data sequence analysis around genomics. And it allows us also to think about the metadata, not only what the viral genomics is, but understanding what species it, the virus is resident, the host range of that virus, the geopositioning of that virus, and its proximity to human populations and livestock, which frequently act as spillover agents, and transform our understanding so ultimately, through a comprehensive viral database, we can begin developing a transformative and disruptive public health toolbox. 
Right now, when we talk about responding to events, we talk about the systems for delivering a response, but we frequently, for these events, don't have a response to deliver, and we scramble to deliver. This is about developing that toolbox today before the event happens tomorrow, and having that toolbox ready. Again, a toolbox that speaks to not just the detailed uh, information that is in genetic profiling, but also the viral ecology and the metadata associated with that and thinking differently about this universe. It's not about Ebola. It's not about Marburg. It's about filoviruses. It's not about Zika. It's not about um, yellow fever or dengue. It's about flaviviruses. How can we begin thinking about those entities in a way that allows us to think about countermeasures not against single agents. You develop a vaccine against yellow fever and it means nothing to Zika. How do we develop countermeasures that speak broadly? And that ultimately this rich data set allows us to begin converting virology into a data rich field. And I, I want us to spend just a minute looking at this slide because think about this pie chart as indicative of every single variant within the coronavirus family. We published a paper um, a few uh, months ago that gave us our first order estimate as to how many individual members of the coronavirus family are there, and we're estimating between three and 5,000. We have two examples here, MERS and SARS. We develop a countermeasure for SARS, it'll mean nothing for MERS. We can develop a countermeasure for MERS, it'll mean nothing for SARS. Imagine, however, if you had for virtually the entirety of the coronavirus family the full range of genomic data sets and running that through machine learning and beginning to think differently about what does it mean to develop a countermeasure, whether CRISPR, uh, uh, CRISPR gene means something, whether it's a vaccine, the opportunity to turn these into shared data fields so that we're not developing individual countermeasures against the current threat. We're developing broad spectrum, whether they're universal or whether they're clusters of a third or more of the family. The point of the matter is when this particular virus here, this green, spills over in the future, having a countermeasure that already cross-reacts with it allows us not to have to wait and scramble. We still don't have a vaccine against Zika. So, Time is an essence, and this is an opportunity to put time on our side. But it's also, as I said, this is not simply about waiting for the epidemic or the pandemic. These are, a con these are not God-given uh, inevitable events that will happen. They're consequences of our footprint on this planet. And by understanding, really, the full range of uh, viral ecology, it allows us to target those areas where we see the greatest risk. And the opportunity to have that viral data set allows us to risk stratify, begin to think about those viruses that speak to greater risk than others, and then align that with what we know about the viral, the metadata around viral ecology, and target and bring focused attention. And I might say it also allows us to lay a marker. These are snapshots in time. It tells us at one moment what the viral sequence is for a particular virus. It tells us one moment in time what its viral ecology looks like. But it allows us the opportunity to develop longitudinal surveillance the same way we monitor influenza every year for the new variant that will come up each influenza season. It allows us to begin putting markers down for longitudinal monitoring, for progressive risk monitoring of these different viruses. You can't do it without this big data. And it's also about more rapid identification of laboratory-enhanced variants. The opportunity, you have already talked about the geospatial location of different viruses. You see it show up someplace it never was before. Uh, you're able to quickly look at the genetic profile against what you have as your, in your database. Your ability to use that, but more fundamentally, the countermeasures that you have should be as equally effective against the new variant as the old. So how do you do this? How do you get this big data haul? 
And it's basically, as I said, the mother load of these viruses sit in Mother Nature. But it's really mammalian and waterfall populations of, uh, of animals that act as these reservoirs. Follow the mammals, follow the waterfowl, and your opportunity is to then begin that kind of harvesting. And I'm just putting this map up because this is about leveraging existent knowledge. What we do know is that the conservation community has done a remarkable job in terms of giving us granular detail about mammalian profiles around the world, looking at their distribution and the composition. Similarly, understanding about breeding sites for waterfowl allow us to understand where you need to go. So if you want to follow the mammals, go where the mammals are. And if you want to follow waterfowl, go where the waterfowl are. And to take this one step further, what we've done is, as I said, there's a group that's collectively working on this. We've taken the mammalian data sets, broken the globe, stripped away the geopolitical boundaries, broken the globe up into 20,000 kilometer grids, and then looked at the conservation data to tell us what the mammalian distribution looks like. And then through a series of very clever modeling that you'll have to talk to modelists about, been able to begin to say, do we have to go everywhere or are there places where we can go and we can get the kind of information that will give us insight into the viral profile? And what we found is that when we look at mammalian viruses, we can go to 108 sites around the world within those 20,000 kilometer grids and we can get what you'll see is basically 71% uh, of the global mammalian virome. And by going into the breeding sites area across the northern hemisphere and some discrete areas in the southern hemisphere, you can get essentially the totality of 85% of the global virome that poses a threat to humans. What we've done, just to illustrate, is that we've taken these countries and then we've broken them up into phase one, phase two, phase three. It's a sort of an organizational way forward. And then we've monetized what it would take in order to be able to do this kind of collection and characterization. And what you see, we have three phases. And when we look at making the unknown known, phase one is in 10 countries. And when you do phase one, you get 41% of the mammalian virome. When you do phase two, you get an additional 21%. Phase three gives you an additional 9%. And as you're running all of this out simultaneously with waterfowl, you get 14%. It gives you 85%. Now you can say, well, what about the other 15%? Well, it's really expensive. When I said we monetize that, if you did a quick math, you would have seen to get 85% of the global viral will cost about $100 million a year over a 10-year period. If you want to do 99%, it'll cost you $7.6 billion. How much of the virome do you really need in order to transform the knowledge base for us to think? The other point is those viruses that we're not capturing because they're more remote, more isolated, and the probability of their interacting with us in the near future is somewhat remote. So it's, a, it's compromising good for perfect, and this is good in a way that allows us to really rethink everything about countermeasures, everything about prevention. Not surprisingly, we spend a lot of time thinking about this in light of the Human Genome Project, because the Human Genome Project is one of those extraordinary disruptive moments. When I began my professional career, before I was with AID and before I was with CDC, I was at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories as a biomedical researcher, a virologist. And it was at the time that my boss, Jim Watson, was first assuming responsibility for the Human Genome Project. Big buzz, everyone was excited, but everyone was also saying, wow, can we do it? Here we are 20 years later, there's not a, there's not a university in this planet Earth that is not asking questions and exploring um, fundamental truths about the human condition that's not based on the Human Genome Project incredibly disruptive, incredibly transformative. And there's not a bit of technology that's operating in these labs that weren't transformed from diagnostics to analytics. Big data became the norm within the Human Genome Project. And think about the relative size of all of the viral data sets we're talking about compared to one human genome. 
So I said that this is a partnership in the formative stage. We're at this developing sort of the intellectual um, sort of integrity of this work. And this is a reflection of the groups in, um, that are making significant investments in health in terms of developing an idea into action. And it's worth noting there are a couple of countries that have taken steps that they want to move this forward. China, both at the level of the Chinese Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, the, uh, and the Beijing Genomics Institute and the Chinese Academy of Sciences have already declared that they will be drawing money from the One Belt, One Road to invest in a China national virome project in concert with the global virome. Similarly with several other countries have stepped forward. We're in the process of mobilizing resources, and we're hoping that we'll be in a position at this upcoming Prince Mayadol Awards Conference in Bangkok, end of January, we will have a formal launch of the Global Viral Project. But when we think about old problems and think about the need for new thinking, think about imagination and innovation, we would offer up that we're in a space and time that challenges us to not keep doing the same thing over and over again, because Albert Einstein offered up another observation, which is by doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, well, need I say more? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Dennis, thank you for setting the charge on innovation. You put a high bar here. Thank goodness you and I are old enough to have been in the malaria control unit before they had CDC. But, uh, <laughs> My, how far we've come. Um, I'd like to hold questions until we go through all our panelists, and I'd like to introduce Don O'Connell at this time. Uh, Don uh, currently serves as the head of the U.S. Office for the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, CEPI. Uh, we covered that earlier in uh, our presentations. Uh, I'm not going to recover that again, but I will tell you a little bit about our background. She was previously the senior counselor for the secretary at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She joined the department in 2011, served as deputy chief of staff, um, and a senior counselor and member of Secretary Burwell's leadership team. She focused on emerging infectious disease issues in global health and helped coordinate or coordinated the department's response to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. I'm pleased to have you. If you'd say a few words, and I'm gonna pass the baton to you. Thank, thank you, you Scott, thank you so much, and Jerry and Jeff, thank you, and our other Texas AMU hosts. It's been a very insightful couple of days, and I'm so pleased when I was offered the opportunity to come a second time and sit on a panel and talk about CEPI, I couldn't resist uh, taking them up on that chance. Um, so I know we have some new members uh, of our audience today now that we're outside of the Chatham House rules. So those of you that were with us yesterday, bear with me for a few minutes. CEPI is the new kid on the block, and I think it's important for those of you that may not be familiar with what we're up to, uh, to understand a little bit about where CEPI came from and why and what we hope to do. Um, so I will start by saying that CEPI is an Ebola lesson learned, or it's an attempt to continue to learn the lessons uh, from the Ebola response. And with that, I'd like to show a, a quick animation. I think they're going to do it. This one started with a bat. A tree. And a boy called Emil. A life full of wonder. And a world to explore. Soon after, he fell sick. And his family did too. Disease spread further still. Uncertainty led to fear. Epidemics affect us all. They affect anyone. At any time. They don't care about borders. Or nations. They are one of our greatest threats. And with our dense cities, easy travel, and ecological change, they spread faster and further than ever before. Businesses close. And airports shut. Billions are spent. And loved ones lost. The sound of a cough <coughs> becomes the worst sound of all. We've sent people into space, created incredible structures, and connected the world in ways we never dreamed. 
but we're yet to outsmart epidemics. We're always a step behind. Because we don't plan, we react. We know vaccines can protect us. We just need to be better prepared. So let's come together. Let's research. And invest. Let's save lives. Let's, let's outsmart epidemics. Thank you. Um, and I'll just start from there. So as we've talked over these last couple of days, uh, vaccine development is risky, it's expensive, and it takes a long time. And even when you have enough money and enough time, you sometimes don't get a good candidate. Some of these challenges came into focus, into sharp focus, during the Ebola outbreak in 2014. And we even had some breaks heading into that outbreak. We had a, a handful of candidates that were already in the pipeline, so we didn't have to start from scratch. And we had uh, industry partners who were willing to put everything aside to do all they could to quickly deploy these candidates into the field. But even with these Herculean efforts, the, um, the, the candidates didn't make it in time to have much of an impact on the epidemic. Not only that, they went into the field in a very uncoordinated way. We had three different trials in three different countries with three different designs. And this made it very difficult for us to get the safety uh, and efficacy data that we needed to prove that these uh, candidates were actually uh, going to be safe for people. In the end, we were able to get enough data from one of the trials. And even with that data, we don't have a licensed vaccine yet. Uh, they're still going through a very rigorous and arduous regulatory process. So seeing this, the world got together and began talking about creating a global vaccine development fund. Angela Merkel in 2015, uh, leading into her G7, uh, hosting the G7 meetings, uh, held a meeting where this was talked about, and everybody agreed that this was necessary. And uh, with considerable work done in the remaining parts of 2015 and through 2016, at Davos this year, in 2017, CEPI was launched. And what CEPI is seeking to do is create vaccines where there otherwise isn't a market for them to prevent future epidemics. So it was launched with $620 million in funding, so fairly well resourced. Uh, because vaccines are so expensive, however, to develop, the five-year plan is, is seeking a billion dollars. So we're at the $620 million. And that money has come from six sovereign nations, the EU, Gates, and Wellcome Trust. So we're grateful for the partners that we have. Um, and we just completed our first call for proposals uh, to focus on the first vaccines that we'll develop. Uh, and a, a, a group called our Scientific Advisory Committee examined the WHO's priority pathogen list. And uh, after considerable debate and conversation, uh, based on various factors, decided to focus on three diseases, Nipah, Lassa, and MERS. So the call for proposals has just concluded and the beginning of the contract negotiation period is starting. Our hope is we'll begin uh, the vaccine development process once those contracts are signed, likely the beginning of next year. In the meantime, we know, and this is one of the things I wanted to draw out of the conversation that I don't think was fully visible yesterday, uh, but fits in with our innovation theme, uh, we know that it will not be one of these three diseases that is likely to cause the next epidemic. We're usually surprised and often caught on our heels, as Zika did uh, last year. So what we've also done and are beginning to get a second call for proposals for is uh, platform technology. And what this will let us do is quickly pivot from one of the portfolio, uh, you know, one of the three diseases that we're looking at, the portfolio that we have for developing those vaccines, and pivot to a pathogen X, whatever that may be, should an epidemic break out that we're not expecting. Uh, so we hope that while we don't have a crystal ball and we can't predict, that this will give us some amount of insurance against whatever pathogen X is and a little bit of a head start in that development. Um, so with that, that, that's what CEPI is, and we're very pleased to be here and be part of this conversation. Don, thank you. That's, uh, we are coming to learn the importance of CEPI, and um, I 
most auspicious beginning. And thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, by the way, uh, there in your packet is the complete bios of our folks up here. And uh, uh, at your leisure, take a look at them. Oh, you don't have time to go through them in their entirety. Uh, some are lengthy, and these are all accomplished people. The next person I'd like to uh, in invite to speak is um, Dr. Joe Fair. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about him and uh, uh, why he's on the panel, and he can uh, talk about his views on innovation and solutions. Uh, Dr. Fair is a virologist. He's a bona fide field work in um, disease detective, uh, viral hunter, hot zone focused kind of guy. Uh, he's worked all over the world and, and uh, most of the continents on uh, many of the hemorrhagic fevers. He is a PhD. He's from Tulane. Uh, he is a uh, founder. He's the founding uh, director of the Burion, an organization dedicated to improving health globally through access to laboratory-based medicine. And he's an expert in the use of laboratory, computing, remote sensor technologies, and has the field experience to back it up. Joe, I'm going to turn this over and let you entertain us. Thank you very much for Thank the you. very generous uh, introduction. Um, I'll start with my background and actually what I did my PhD on. So, and, and I'll start with a phrase or a statement. That for me, the Ebola epidemic at West Africa should have never happened for a number of reasons. Um, I did my PhD in that part of the world on loss of fever and you know, seeing a hyper-endemic area for hemorrhagic fever was one, a very rare thing, and it, it was the one place where we could study a hemorrhagic fever in a non-outbreak setting. And so for many years, we used Sierra Leone and Liberia in particular to train healthcare workers of how to deal with hemorrhagic fevers in low resource settings, because it really did us no good to bring them to the NIH and teach them how to deal with a hemorrhagic fever at the NIH, because it had absolutely nothing to do with what they were going to go home to at the time. And then I come back as a virologist, I'm always interested in finding new viruses as they're spilling over into the environment. But what I found out from that experience was we had found evidence of Ebola from 2007 to 2010 in Sierra Leone. Uh, patients that were admitted for loss of fever that went negative for loss of fever, they had IgM-specific antibodies to Ebola Zaire. They were obviously in that ward because they had had hemorrhagic fever. That data was submitted to emerging infectious diseases to be published, and then the geographical biases and science biases come in, and they told us that it wasn't real data, it must be cross reactivity. So that paper really sat in limbo for years and years and years, and not surprisingly, the very first week of the Ebola outbreak, we were contacted that they wanted to publish the paper. And so <laughs> it came out, so and you know, looking back at the disease hotspot maps, <clears throat> those areas were bright red for a disease hotspot. So mm. we knew that there was every chance something was going to happen there. We had a hyperendemic hemorrhagic fever, Lhasa, you know, the Andromeda strain, the original Andromeda strain. And then we had evidence of another hemorrhagic fever co-circulating at the same time, in addition to yellow fever, West Nile, monkeypox, and everything else we were finding in the area. So we had the information, but nothing happened from the information. It was reported to the World Health Organization. It was sent up our chain at DOD. These were DOD research studies at the time. The data was there, but absolutely nothing resulted because of that data. And so I really shifted more of my focus now on how do we change how we respond to these viruses? Because even if we have the data and we know they we're there, it didn't really make a difference in how we responded to this. And so I started thinking about different ways and all of the different problems that we had. And I remember Jeremy and I were sitting on a congressional panel uh, a couple of years ago, and they were asking, what are your major challenges? And the major challenges aren't sexy. They don't have to do with sequencing or anything else. The major challenges are always the same. I can't get a phone call to go through to the person that I need to contact. The epidemiologists that were being sent were data crunchers. They weren't field epidemiologists. Uh, we didn't have any field epidemiologists. Once we did have the field epidemiologists, they couldn't get to where they needed to go. All of those technologies exist to allow those things to happen. We just had no way of getting them where they needed to be, when they needed to be there, in a coordinated fashion. And I, I really like to use the word coordinated because, one, it was a scientific free-for-all. Uh, researchers gone wild showing up in an Ebola <laughs> outbreak <laughs> and sequencing and publishing and completely bypassing ministries of health to get their names into papers. Uh, you know, all of that happening, 
responders coming and you have no idea what their backgrounds were, how they were trained, have they ever been in West Africa, have they ever been in a low resource environment, have they ever dealt with hemorrhagic fever, most of the answer to that was no. We got a lot of patients that uh, returned because of that. We knew that there was the possibility of people getting infected, but we hadn't really thought about how we were going to get them back. We at one time, and Jerry's very familiar, had a, a military response group based at USAMRID, which its sole purpose was to respond within 24 hours and bring people back and put them in the BSL-4 hospital. We stood that facility down almost 12 years ago um, because it was considered, I, I know that, it was considered too expensive to maintain. Um, so after this outbreak in particular, because it was very life-changing for me, I started to think about how can we do this differently? And you know, there's a ton of conspiracy theories when you deal with outbreaks, and I always say anyone that believes in conspiracy theory hasn't really worked in government because we really struggle with like conference calls and getting everybody on the <laughs> same page, uh, et cetera. So um, I started t talking to different groups, and I was just a few weeks back uh, at the Jackson Hole Technology Summit with um, a very diverse group of individuals, everyone from Northrop Grumman and Bell Helicopters to uh, Palantir Sciences, et cetera. So a very digressive of technology um, and partners. And I came across this project, I'd say about a year ago. Uh, this, uh, what I have on the screen here, the REV, the Research Expedition Vehicle. So this is a public-private partnership between the Dutch government and the World Wildlife Federation because what they've noticed was, yes, it's wonderful to go around the world and build the capacity to research these things in all of the places in which they occur but that's just not an attainable goal right now. Not one cell organization, not one sole government, and not really even the international agencies such as WHO, none of us have been able to make that happen. And while that still needs to go on, capacity building still has to happen, we've got to start thinking differently about how we respond because we run into the exact same problems in almost every epidemic. And again, it's not sexy, but it all is logistics, computing, supplies, et cetera. So I started looking at their ship and everything that they had on their ship, laboratories, communication centers, everything else that they had here. And I started thinking, what did we require during the outbreak? And so every single piece that you'll see on here, I'll have to turn around to do this, but these are all things that we ended up having to use during the outbreak and we deployed during the outbreak, but they came in piecemeal. They came in over a 12 to 13 month period of time. Uh, emergency operations centers. What I learned basically from this, and I would say after the Amerithrax incident, is we're very responsive to major events with infrastructure. And you know, there was, after Amerithrax, a proliferation of BSL-4 laboratories and high containment laboratories all over the country because somehow we thought that that was gonna help <laughs> us respond better to another Amerithrax. And now those very facilities are struggling for funding and how are they gonna stay open, et cetera. So, we know that there are infrastructure dollars in response to major epidemics, and uh, it's the infrastructure the du jour, I would say, because emergency operation centers proliferated across West Africa once uh, the first one was set up. And what I learned from that experience is you can build a new building with lots of screens and buttons, but if someone is not trained in an emergency operations mindset and how to work with one another, it's just a building with a lot of buttons where everyone is very confused. Um, Communications, a constant issue. Um, this is where public private partnerships again come back into play. Communications are available. Oil companies use these all the time. Iridium just launched 23 new satellites into a, in addition to its 16 existing satellites. Private industry has really capitalized on these technologies and it's worked very, very well for them. Um, We've really gone through a Gutenberg evolution with laboratory technologies and everything that used to take buildings and buildings now can be broken down into a container. Um, this lab here on the left, this is a currently existing model laboratory from uh, Amabio, a French laboratory, fits in a 40 foot container. Uh, these are some of the most impressive laboratories I've ever seen. And you know, we've deployed mobile laboratories, but when we say mobile laboratories in this country, it usually means three or four buildings connected with massive power supplies. This is truly just a 40-foot container with one power supply. Everything can be monitored remotely with a 3G SIM card, and I was sitting in Paris watching the laboratory in Bolivia, and I'm able to tell them their HEPA filter is down on number three, 
And more importantly, in the case of terrorism, you can actually shut the, down, the, shut the laboratory down remotely if you need to. And in a lot of the areas we work, we worry about biosecurity and where samples are stored. Um, mobile operations centers and mobile EOCs, because we learned, yeah, it's great to build one in the capital, but if the outbreak is happening way out in the bush, you need an EOC there. Supplies, um, we didn't have a way to get patients back. So this was from the, funded by the Paul Allen Foundation and the State Department. Uh, this was something, a former group I used to work with on the left here. We recently constructed this um, patient, it's called the CBCS module, but it's designed to transport up to six patients with their caregivers all at the same time. It's completely contained. Um, and we recently conducted an ex exercise where we flew it from Dobbins Air Force Base in Atlanta. We flew it to both Gabon, then to Senegal, back to Washington, and back to uh, Atlanta after that. We picked up mock patients while we were there. We had the caregivers in the unit with them while they were in the airplane. On the way back, everything worked great. Um, a good 70% of the world's population lives along the coast. So <laughs> this may seem like, oh, it's going to take a boat a long time to get there. If it takes a boat 14 days, I can tell you that's a lot faster than 13 months piecemeal, piece by piece, coming <laughs> in by every different direction in a completely uncoordinated fashion. Um, just basic transport, ruggedized transport. Um, these red motorcycles here, I, I draw this because it's not particularly sexist, it's not particularly innovative. These were actually designed for hunters. I know that because I have one myself. <laughs> Uh, I contacted them during Ebola and I said, you know, I know this is going to sound funny, but you actually have the perfect transport unit for Ebola epidemiologists because that particular unit there, the, you'll notice the tires are very fat. You can fill those with fuel and they go 600 miles round trip on one, one you know, filling. I had them equipped with a cold storage unit. The nice thing about the bike, you can plug a cold storage unit into it and it worked as a generator. So the cold storage units worked. They float because a lot of the places that you're going to, you have to cross rivers and tributaries, so you can take it across, et cetera. Um, the Gibbs Amphibitruck, this is another industry leader in amphibitrucks, and yeah, that may sound like a super state-of-the-art future technology, which it is, but it's actually an incredibly useful one when you're trying to get supplies from this area to this area, and you have absolutely no other way to do it. Uh, as I mentioned, the Bell Helicopter folks were there the last week, as well as Sikorsky, and we started talking with them about, you know, how could you equip, say, an S-92 helicopter to be on this ship? Because you'll notice two helipads on the ship, and that's on purpose. Mm -hmm. That is to get the supplies, people, samples, everything else to where they need to be, back and forth. And while it may seem like a lot, imagine the infrastructure dollars that we pour into permanent facilities that can't be moved anywhere, and we're waiting for samples to be sent back by a DHL and commercial carriers stuck in customs going through all everything else. So my thought on this is changing how we respond to these things and making it much more mobile. And you might ask, what would this do in the off time? Well, for me, this would be how you would train people to build emergency operations centers. You would go to the places when there aren't outbreaks using your crew of, say, 90 here, and that crew can be changed and rotated, et cetera, uh, to deliver that training. But I have to come back to one thing that, you know, w even with this equipment, even with the technology, I come back to Mr. Card's talk this morning. It really all comes down to leadership. Uh, I can tell you even now, I'm still not quite clear who was the leader in the Ebola outbreak. Uh, I was quite surprised that we had to even elect someone to be an Ebola czar. You know, I grew up in the days where our disease czar was C. Everett Koop. Um, we had one, it was the Surgeon General that was empowered to do his job, and he had a very clear command structure for doing that. So I think even with all this technology, and even if we invest in larger projects like this, and I think this is a great example, and a ship is not a panacea, but it mm -hmm. could solve a lot of problems and get things to where they need to be, as well as people where they need to be, and thinking about sending advance teams in, in advance to be communicating with you as you're coming there to prep for the situation. Mm -hmm being able to integrate locals into an already functioning EOC instead of trying to give them an EOC and saying, here you go. Um, I think without leadership, all of this won't mean anything. So um, that's, I'll leave it with those comments. Joe, sure, thank you. Um, I thought for a while you had repurposed Paul Allen's yacht. Yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> It's actually but not by accident that I, I present that because, uh, you know, Larry Brilliant, Paul, all of them, if yeah. you talk to any of them, 
all those big ideas happened on big boats. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's time to migrate his, um, his yacht to a higher calling. And I, I will say also that uh, it's not by accident that I present this here. Very few people are aware that mm. Texas A&M does have the Maritime Academy in Galveston and a whole fleet of ships. And a whole fleet of ships, <laughs> that, that'd be true. Anyway, thank you. Um, let me uh, move to our next speaker. I'm going to pick Jeremy. Let me give you a little brief introduction of Jeremy Cunnendike. He's a senior policy fellow at the Center for Global Development. His research focuses on humanitarian response, USAID policy reform, and global outbreak preparedness. Um, he previously served in the Obama administration from 2013 to 2017 as director of USAID's Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, OFTA. For the many in this room, that uh, is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, he led the U.S. government's response to international disasters throughout the world. Um, in any given year, OFTA responds to about 50 to 70 disasters a year. He led major U.S. government humanitarian responses during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. We're proud to have him here. Jeremy, it's all yours. Thanks. Um, I have no slides, and um, uh, that's because I don't have, so what I'm going to talk about doesn't really have pictures. It's, it's a little more conceptual, but, um, but stick with me. Uh, so I've given a lot of thought since Ebola to why we were caught so flat-footed, and um, I think Joe has covered part of it. Um, Dennis has covered part of it with the, the, you know, the fact that we don't have the, the mapping of the available countermeasures that we need. But that's only a piece of the equation. Um, and um, for those of you who, who uh, um, for those of you as I did, grew up on um, after school specials, knowing is only half the battle. Um, so we can have, it, it, what was very difficult about Ebola was we, we knew the basic science of the disease. We knew the basic set of available countermeasures that existed. What we didn't know was what to do with that knowledge once the outbreak got to a massive scale. So the challenge was not so much a knowledge gap. It was, it was you know, to borrow Dennis's term, an imagination gap for how do, you, how do you concoct a response at scale that's going to need to look quite significantly different from what you do at a smaller scale. So to put that in, in, in uh, some numerical terms, the largest Ebola outbreaks in history prior to the one in West Africa had been, what, 400, 500 cases total? We had days in West Africa where we were getting that many cases, individual days. And that is a whole other level of scale. So with a traditional Ebola outbreak, you would need one, maybe two ETUs, uh, Ebola treatment units, where patients could be brought and isolated. That can be the center of your entire response um, <clears throat> everything is focused on getting the patients into the isolation uh, in an ETU, treating them there, and that's, that's the principal way that you would break the, trans the chains of transmission for Ebola and thus uh, uh, extinguish the outbreak. You can't scale that to the level that we needed to scale it as rapidly as we needed to scale it. Uh, the, the process of, of setting up one Ebola treatment unit at a level of about 20, 20 beds you would have uh, <clears throat> 100 to 200 staff. Uh, you, you'd have uh, MSF, generally it would be MSF, who had people on board who were already trained and knew how to do it. They'd get a refresher, they'd get their equipment, and they could set up very, very rapidly. Setting up a single uh, ETU that's five times that size is a much more difficult thing. Setting up 50 ETUs across three countries, four when, when Mali came online, um, so setting up 50 ETUs that are each five times the size of a traditional ETU is yet another scale problem. And so we face enormous challenges with uh, how, do we, how do we get a design that we can scale up quickly enough that they can be built, uh, find the land. How do you find the people? There were not the people to staff them. Um, once you found the people, how do you get them trained? Because there's a finite number of people. So we ran into operational hurdle after operational hurdle. And it was hugely difficult. And what we realized was ETUs were not going to be the way that we would defeat this, at least not on their own. That could not be the centerpiece of the response the way it would be in a normal, traditional Ebola response on a smaller scale. And so we had to innovate other ways to do it in real time. And, and so what we ended up doing, and, and Dennis you know, will remember a lot of very laborious and painful conversations that we had in, in the Reagan building at AID trying to figure out 
what spaghetti do we need to be throwing at the wall? And we threw a lot of spaghetti at the wall. And um, what made it so difficult was there was really no template to look at to say, here are the things you ought to be doing, or even here are the things you ought to be trying. And so it was this months long process of brainstorming and seeing what worked and iterating forward based on what we saw. Um, and where we ultimately ended up, uh, the, you know, the ETUs ultimately all came online. They came, by the time they came online in Liberia, the, the curve had already been bent, and it had been bent by other interventions that were not clinical interventions. It was bent by things like uh, safe burial teams, community outreach, uh, infection prevention and control um, improvements at uh, health facilities and things like that. And the takeaway there for me and I am not a clinical person, I'm not a health expert, I don't have a PhD in anything. Um, I'm an operator, and uh, I've spent my whole career doing humanitarian response. So the takeaway for me is that in, in a future pandemic scenario, it is highly unlikely that we will find a solution through clinical means. Uh, it is highly unlikely that we will be able mm -hmm. to bring a vaccine online at sufficient scale uh, to save a significant number of lives in the first year or two. It is highly unlikely that we will be able to develop a, a therapeutic uh, countermeasure that will make a difference in the, in the first year or two. It is, uh, it, 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 all of these things, you know, they may be possible in the longer run. They're not going to make a difference in the immediate term. And yet, if you, you, know, you, you, you come to conferences like this one, you look at the literature, uh, all, uh, much of the planning around how we will deal with a future pandemic event is premised on some, in some way or another, developing the clinical countermeasures that will ultimately extinguish it. And we have a huge gap, and so I don't have an innovation to present, I guess I have an innovation to call for. Um, uh, we have a huge gap in terms of mapping out the non-clinical countermeasures for different types of disease scenarios with the same rigor that we are putting towards things like what Dennis is outlining with the Global Virulent Project. Because when that big outbreak comes, when that big pandemic emerges, we will need to do something non-clinical to keep as many people alive for as long as possible until the clinical side catches up. And it's likely the clinical, the clinical tools will be how it's extinguished, they will not be how it's contained. And uh, there is, uh, one of the things I've been doing on the margins of this conference is just pulling everybody aside and saying, hey, so here's what I'm thinking, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a health guy, so am I just missing, a, am I missing something here? Is there a big piece, of, is there some planning out there where this is already all mapped out? And um, the answers I've basically gotten mm -hmm. are no, that there is, mm -hmm. there was some, some good solid planning on the operational side and on the policy side that was done around pandemic influenza in the mid to late 2000s. Other risks, whether that's full pandemic or to borrow um, the, the term from Michael Osterholm, the critical regional um, threats, there's very, very little done. And um, so we have a critical gap because if we can't develop that, if we can't develop the sort of operational and policy tools that we're going to need, what we're going to find is we will, we will be on the merry go round, just as we were with Ebola the next time around, trying to figure out in real time crap, okay, so we know, you know, we know this basic disease, we know the, the basic science of it, but how you translate that into an operational toolkit is, uh, it takes a lot of thought. And we have some lessons there from Ebola, but the, they, there has been very little in the way of comprehensive planning to analyze what are the characteristics of this disease or this family of diseases, how it spreads, what its incubation period looks like, where it's, um, you know, where it's likely to emerge. What is that, you know, the, the, the sort of cultural environment, one of the challenges with Ebola was the, the, the cultural factors that enabled it spread. Looking at those sorts of factors and figuring out what are then the operational tools, the non-clinical countermeasures that we need to be deploying or may need to be deploying in order to contain that until the clinical side catches up. Um, so some of the work that I'll be doing at CGD, at, my, at the Center for Global Development where I, where I work in Washington, is going to look at this and trying to map together uh, what do we know about the big threats that are out there? What can, we, what can we posit about how an outbreak would likely emerge and how it would evolve? And what would be the ways we could interrupt the chains of transmission using scale, much more easily scalable non-clinical means until the clinical side catches up? And it won't be burial teams again. It probably will be something behavioral. Um, it will be something around communications and, and, and uh, spurring behavior change. It will be around um, 
community engagement. I don't know if Rod Waldman is still here, but he had some very passionate remarks yesterday about the need to not just think about the tech but as, or the operations, but to also remember it's, it's about how that hits the community and how the community perceive, perceives it, especially when you're talking about changing behavior. Um, because that is just as critical a piece of the toolkit as all of the clinical tools that we're used to talking about. Um, but it's an area that is much, much less covered. And I would, um, just a last word, and, and totally agreeing with what Joe said and, and picking up on what Secretary Card said earlier, the importance of leadership in all of this cannot be overstated. One of the hardest things for the government to do is to innovate in real time something it was not built to do. To take a, a set of tools that were not designed to do thing X, whether that's respond to Ebola, uh, whether that's, um, you know, I, I think similar challenge right now in Puerto Rico, a very different style of response yeah. from what FEMA is used to seeing. Um, and adapt the tools to do something they haven't had to do before. And that takes really committed, disciplined, rigorous leadership. So the importance of that going forward can't be overstated. Thanks. Thank you. Well, last but not least, I'd like to introduce the last speaker on our panel, Dr. Barry Holtz. Let me tell you a little bit about him. One is Dr. Holtz has been associated with innovation for a long time. He's the president of iBio CMO, our contract manufacturing organization, and is a recognized international expert on the design and construction of pharmaceutical facilities and uh, was instrumental in the development of GCON, a, a local company with mobile clean rooms. Dr. Holtz has 30 years experience in the development of bioproducts and biopharmaceuticals and served uh, 15 years as senior vice president for large-scale biology corporations. He was responsible for product development, clinical development, and compliance, uh, but I think the real contribution uh, lately and the one that is really changing uh, the, the global market on medications, therapeutics, and vaccines is the approach of iBio to plant-based therapeutics, which opens up a completely new avenue and a potential for a cheaper, better, faster uh, pharmaceutical products in the future. Dr. Holtz. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, if I could ask the young lady to start the movie for me. Um, I'm going to show you a movie, but I'm going to talk over it, so it's a little bit of a multitasking effort here. <clears throat> My colleague has just pointed out very clearly why we still might not be quick enough to stop a pandemic but at least we might be able to accelerate this clinical solution that, that you talked about. iBio uh, was a facility that was started by a, uh, a mechanism uh, initiated by DARPA, and it was the Blue Angel Project, which was part of the advanced manufacturing project at, at DARPA. And DARPA looked at a bunch of uh, rapid expression systems to make proteins and therapeutics plants bubbled up as the, one of the more advanced and more utilitarian uh, things that they looked at. Our particular uh, expertise was both in plants and in uh, flexible downstream facilities. So we were selected to be part of this Blue Angel project. And our, our, our project uh, uh, goal was we were set to build a commercial facility to demonstrate that a commercial facility could uh, not only develop the product, uh, expedite the manufacturing of the product, and produce it under CGMP conditions in a period of a very short time. So the DARPA goal was to make 50 million doses of a protein, an antigen, and do this in 12 weeks from getting the gene sequence. That was it. So it had to be a hardened facility. It had to be a facility that would uh, stand weather, uh, climate conditions, and so forth. And growing plants uh, under those conditions meant that we had to grow them inside hydroponically. And that's what we built as a facility to grow a large number of plants. We use plants as bioreactors. And we grow generic bioreactors. Our, our generic bioreactor is an eight gram plant. We just grow 2.2 million of them at one time. So we always have bioreactors ready to go. And that was the premise of this whole thing. The way we utilize the plants is we create a bacterial, uh, combination bacterial viral vector 
that inserts a new gene into the nucleus of the plant. We hijack the protein machinery, the protein synthesis machinery of the plant for a period of seven days after that inoculation, and then we harvest the plants and harvest the protein. So DARPA obviously thought, gee, if we could have a supply of bioreactors that's generic, we're only 20 days away from a vector and a start of production, this, this makes some sense. So this was a big challenge to do this. Uh, we put together a great group of people. This facility, by the way, is a mile and a half from here. Uh, it's the best kept secret, secret in Bryan College Station. Uh, like my, uh, my significant other says, uh, if you ever watch the movie Contagion, I would be the guy that runs the facility that's in the unknown location. Um, <laughs> So we grow our plants hydroponically. You can see from this picture one of the growing rooms. Our plants are grown 15 layers high and under LED lights. A human never touches our plants. We have no organic materials used in growing our plants. It's simply minerals and light. So we get away from all of the adventitious virus issues and things from mammalian cell culture and the fact that we don't have to develop a cell line every time to do this. This is a big engine. Uh, we grow 350,000 kilos of plants in a year. That can produce, in monoclonal antibody terms, 300 kilograms of final product of a MAB in one year. So it's a big engine. We, we look at this as a way to, to facilitate the uh, development of subunit vaccines and possibly antiviral monoclonal antibodies. Uh, this facility has got to be a business. Uh, DARPA built it, and as DARPA does, they set these en enormous goals, which are really challenging. Uh, DARPA is a blast to work with, by the way. Uh, but at the end, they declare victory and then pass the technology on to other places in the government and in the public. And this has to be actualized into a business. So six years ago, we put this place online and we demonstrated that we could do exactly what DARPA said and make 50 million doses in 12 weeks. Since then, we've had to turn it into a commercial enterprise. And in doing so, we've become a CDMO, a contract development manufacturing operation. We have multiple clients that we make proteins for, uh, from both public sectors and private sectors. Uh, we, make, we can make very challenging proteins because plants have a high tolerance for mammalian proteins. Plants don't make antibodies, so they really don't care that they've got a lot on board. It doesn't seem to bother them very much. So we can do a lot of things and be very flexible in this, in this entire operation. The, uh, Without boring you with any of the details of all of this, and you're welcome to ask questions later, I've got one more slide, and that is uh, we have a slightly different business model. Over the years, we have worked with a number of uh, organizations in a number of countries, and I don't think we've forgotten the roots that started our company and uh, the social obligation that we feel in this deal. So specifically, we've been working in Brazil with Fiocruz Biomeganos to develop a new yellow fever vaccine, a subunit-based vaccine. And at this point, what we are willing to do is go to Brazil, design, build a facility, train the people here, develop the product here, even launch the product here, and then transfer it to the country of choice. The, it's the gift that keeps on giving. So then we can do the next one and transfer the next one. And it's, it's, it's a scenario that it seems to be working in Brazil and construction started in Fortaleza for a facility there. Uh, we're willing to do this at cost. Our, our cost recovery or our profit recovery will be upon success of the drug. And we'll take a royalty and a fee like everybody else. We've done the same thing in South Africa. We're just starting to do this. And for a company of 40 people, I added it up the other day, and we've spent $13 million in these two efforts over the last seven years. So for a company of 40 people, this represents one heck of an investment. Uh, we're looking forward to next week 
we go to South Africa and put on a symposium there with all of the people in the room, the policymakers that Jerry has put into this room this year. Jerry's going with us just to make sure I don't screw up, so that's really good. But uh, we, we got some heavy hitters coming there. But we're gonna put all of the people in the room, let the public agencies talk about, and the private agencies talk about their programs, and then go into a Chatham House Rules meeting and talk about a blueprint for actually doing something. No white paper, no philosophical document. When do you wanna start pouring concrete? And we'll see how that works. I'll be glad to report maybe next year on the progress, but that's, that's our story. Barry, thank you. We are at the end of our panel. We have time for two or three questions from the audience. So those who have burning questions, uh, please come up to the mics. Uh, we'll give you a few seconds to get oriented here. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna close out with uh, a few statements and uh, ask each of the panelists uh, a single question uh, for a, a quick, concise answer, dealing with what they think one of the most important policy issues on the deck and uh, tailor this question towards young people that are up and coming. And I'll go there. Uh, we're lined up. Um, who was first over here? Mr. Ito. Let me give the policy question to this and, uh, and charge the uh, panel with thinking about this. We'll ask when we're done with the questions. Mr. Ito, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Um, my name is Ito. Uh, empowered to hear um, that uh, innovation uh, can uh, make breakthroughs uh, for our upcoming pandemic. And um, as far as I see here from the panelists, um, there are two kinds of innovation that are roughly classifying. Uh, first is the technological innovation, and the second is social innovation. And I'd like to quickly ask uh, two questions. Um, as for the technological uh, innovations, um, whether it's the big data or the uh, vaccine development or, uh, or uh, developing a new products, uh, what, are, what, is the, what are the measures to um, uh, attract uh, scientists or technologists to come in more for these innovations? Uh, because uh, in Japan, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the budget for the science and uh, research innovations uh, are now uh, dispersed in uh, different countries. So uh, every research uh, institute or university has to get funds mm. from different sources. And uh, especially young scientists um, are, um, are really, um, um, it, it, they are really uh, fragile in getting uh, the permanent uh, employment from the research institute, which sometimes uh, discourages them to continue uh, their research and that might affect the technological innovations uh, advance more. So uh, what, are, um, what are the solutions for this um, attracting uh, young scientists for more innovations mm -hmm. uh, in this uh, technological advancement? And the second is about the um, uh, social um, innovation. Um, uh, social innovations uh, we sometimes found, find in uh, some countries, especially in developing countries, that uh, especially in local areas, they have their own wisdom already. But we sometimes, when we get in the community uh, and, uh, and get deep, deeply into uh, the, the, the people, we find that we, are, we have already some uh, solutions, not, I mean the non-clinical interventions that might uh, address the pandemics, pandemics uh, more efficiently. But what, what, is, um, uh, what is the issue is that the social innovations are sometimes yeah. not um, are not um, visualized or, or shared, you know, yeah. on a written basis. So, what are the measures to make these uh, hidden social innovations that have been already uh, that, that that has already been uh, in at field to be described more on a written basis or shared uh, globally uh, among uh, the stakeholders of the government uh, of shows or NGOs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, we'll do our best here. Um, Joe or Dennis, do you want to care to tackle this? 
I, I, I'll tackle the first question just because I have a little bit of an experience with that myself. I think at least in the traditional uh, biosciences graduate model, um, it is highly emphasized that you should focus on basic research. Uh, when I started my own degree, I wanted to do a translational research product that resulted in a very low cost commercial diagnostic for loss of fever. And I can tell you everyone from the dean down was very discouraging of this approach until we received $12 million to do it. And um, after that, well, it now it's a very large shift from basic biomedical research where we're talking about protein folding, all of that, which is extremely important, but also having a portfolio of translational research and not only not discouraging it, encouraging it uh, as disruptive. Um, I don't think there's very much of that yeah. taking place. I, I think it's coming about more and more, but we got so focused for so long in training in very basic science procedures and research that there's not a whole lot of emphasis in training scientists in translational research. Yeah. One of the groups that we had extensive discussions with and we're working on an MOU with right now is the Chan Zuckerberg um, Biohub. Um, group in uh, uh, San Francisco. And I, I point them out because they've been uh, given uh, a significant body of resources by the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation. And it really is to have a, an investment in research that's both translational and transformative. And looking, they see the kind of big data that we're talking about is the underpinnings for that kind of um, effort. So if, if they want to invest in that, they need the data in order to drive it forward. So if I was thinking about universities, you know, the question is, you know, uh, what's the data that they have that allows them to think uh, and really research in a way that is so fundamentally different than what they've been doing? And I think that's the key issue that they're gonna have to grapple with regardless of what the field is. Um, but you know, the op we're moving in not just within this domain, the, the opportunity for uh, uh, just the transformation of data access and then data management. Machine learning allows us to think fundamentally differently about how we um, take massive amounts of data and begin to use it for asking questions that we never could have imagined asking. And I think we're at that cusp where the next generation of researchers are going to be asking questions fundamentally different than what they have. It's sort of if you read the newspaper this morning, you know, there's a report on gravitational field that's simultaneous with, you know, a sort of ocular um, documentation. The whole world for gravitational research is so fundamentally different today because of what's happened just in the last two years. And I think you need to think about those, you know, what are the things that are going to open up a whole new universe? And that's going to create that next generation of academics, researchers, scientists. These are exciting times. Good deal. Thank and, you. you I, I, yeah, just on the second point of the question for social, I can only give you one example that very much sticks out in my mind. Um, I think on the social, on the social innovation side, um, what I found out in this last outbreak is the primary source of information is Facebook, it is Twitter, it is all of those things. And I think communicating correct information very early on with the leaders of those organizations so they can help distribute it, because I go to the example of the message during the Ebola outbreak from the beginning was there's no treatment or vaccine for Ebola virus, but please show up to an Ebola treatment unit. So the automatic <laughs> question in the locals' head was why on earth would I go there if there's no vaccine or treatment, everyone that's going in there is dying. dying. So no one thought about the impact of prefacing that sentence with there's no treatment, there's no vaccine, yeah. but I need you to come to the hospital. Um, in our minds, we automatically think, I need to go to the hospital because that's my best chance. In their minds, locally and culturally, that meant you're sending them there to die and I don't want to go there. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's, I don't know if I'd call it social and event, we don't have a I don't know if we have a great term for it, actually, but it is this issue of how do the how do the tools that we have interface with and how are they received by the the, the population that is affected? And um, 
you know, Ron yesterday used this, the, the, the terminology of, are we engaging with the, the communities as partners or as objects? And very often, especially early on in the, the yeah. Ebola outbreak, we were engaging with the communities as objects. So here are the instructions to you of what you need to do in order to help us succeed in da -da. And not engaging with them in a way of uh, that, that recognized how they, see the, how they see the challenge and what they're prioritizing. And um, I think we got much better on that as time went on. The other thing I'd say, is it, is really, it is really crucial to equip communities with some of the just basic information on how they can protect themselves. Because you, know, you may not be able to anticipate how they will use that, but they can then take that key information and adapt that to their own setting in a way that is, you know, that can be quite effective. One, just one very pedestrian example, there were communities in Liberia where once they realized what some of the symptoms from Ebola were and, and realized what the threat of spread is, um, you know, many communities in West Africa will be on two sides of a road. So they would have the, um, they would have two old men from the village at either end of the, at either end of the village, um, each road entrance to the village, and they would stop everyone who came in and they would take their temperature. And if you had a fever, you went on this side of the road. And if you didn't have a fever, you could keep going or you would, you know, you could go on the other side of the road. And so it was a very rudimentary but quite effective way of doing some interim quarantine and doing and, and, and having some, some uh, preventive measures in place to, to prevent spread. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is that going to end the outbreak? No. Is that reduce the threat of transmission, of unknown transmission? Yes. And, um, and that's something that, you know, you wouldn't design that from on top of every village should do this, but by equipping every village, every community with some of the key information on how they can protect themselves, they will then adapt yeah. that to their local setting. Let me do this as um, sort of the organizer and trying to stay on time. Uh, let's do one more question. Thank you. And, uh, and we'll end the panel after this your question. My name is Gary Evans. I'm a professor over in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, Dennis mentioned the next generation. As I look up here, I see a few gray hairs sticking out here and there. And I think in order to increase the bandwidth for the next generation, we need to see about how interesting this is to students that we now have here in uh, Texas A&M and across the nation. I happen to teach in a course on uh, biomedical sciences and biomedical engineering and its application in the future. There are about 300 students in the class, two sections of 150. And I give a little lecture on bioterrorism and biopreparedness and, and bioresponsiveness. And I want to tell you the interest of the students in this area of work is absolutely overwhelming. So the opportunities are there to recruit and um, assist the students to find a pathway for them to develop into Dr. Joseph Ferris and others like him because they're there and they're really interesting to do that. Here in our university, we have the Global One Health Program, which Dr. Jerry Parker heads up. You can enroll in Global Health uh, agenda, global health security agenda now to become involved. So I'm recruiting you. If you're out there as a student and you're interested, come and see me or go and see Dr. Parker. I guarantee you we'll find a way. And you see what they did today to open our minds about what the future may look like. And you can make it look like the way it's going to be. So I'm recruiting heavily Thank you for opening our minds today on the new technology and how we might be able to use it from the whole virome to how do you operationalize it and how do you, how do you use the newest technology. Thank you. Well, this concludes our panel. I'd like to thank everybody. This was an exciting panel from all the way from the molecular level to the operational level and into the future of uh, healthcare and service delivery. Uh, I want to thank everybody. I'd like to give them a big hand and we'll conclude. Uh, while we disassemble here, we're going to get ready for our final keynote speech by Dr. Peter Hotez. So don't go away. Uh, we're going to set up and take about a minute or two and we'll get started. Don't go away. Don't, don't, don't go away.
Did I grab my? Great, thank you. Testing. Talker and I'm gonna try to stand up here. Okay. Okay, then I'll, I'll introduce you over here. Peter, thanks again for coming. We'll get started. Well, let me call everybody back to their seats. Uh, we, um, uh, we relish the time to visit and uh, communicate with our, our colleagues, but uh, we do want to get towards the feature presentation of today, and that's our keynote speech. So while you're getting in your seats, we're getting set up. We'll get started in a few seconds. And um, just give us the high sign, Jerry Parker, and we'll get started. Ready? Okay. Well, we're at our feature presentation, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Hotez. So let me tell you a little bit about him. You've got his bio, and you can read it at length, but I, I want to highlight some personal things that are really important here uh, with a little bit of a, a caveat, an overview of some of his accomplishments and perhaps some of his future accomplishments here. Uh, Peter Hotez is the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Virology and Microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine. It's a good place because some of us in this room uh, trained at the Baylor College of Medicine. And uh, he's also the director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development. And uh, he's the Texas Children's Hospital Endowed Chair of Tropical Pediatrics. Now, there are not a lot of tropical medicine, tropical diseases, uh, institutes, schools uh, in the world anymore, um, perhaps because we've become such a global health kind of intermixed kind of um, world that we live in. However, Peter operates one of the few that are left. He's an internationally recognized physician scientist, and I say physician scientist because he he speaks clinically and he speaks about the science equally as well, uh, depending on uh, the needs. Uh, he's been um, uh, involved in everything from hookworm to schistosomiasis to Chagas disease, MERS, and you name it, and has helped co-found the Global 
network for neglected tropical diseases. Um, no small feat. Uh, remember that uh, the big uh, lucrative diseases get the money, get the investment, and the neglected tropical diseases affect the bulk of the population on the planet. So that it's no small task that he's done that. He has uh, been a thought leader for the Zika response, as many of you on TV um, uh, saw Peter Hotez on CNN and Nightline and you name it. Uh, he was there explaining the disease spread, how it works, uh, calming the population, but providing facts at the same time. He's a master at that. He, in addition, he is both a vaccine scientist and a, a father, an autism dad or a, of a child with autism. And he's led the national effort to defend vaccines against uh, charges that they caused autism, other diseases, and the anti-vaxxer movement in general. Uh, this is no small feat in that uh, he has had personal attacks uh, far and wide from the anti-vaccine establishment. And uh, he has a new book coming out that um, uh, will lay out some of the cogent arguments for why vaccines are so very important. It's a great honor for me to introduce him. Uh, a year doesn't go by when somebody doesn't mention Peter Hotez for the Nobel Prize as a maybe. So I'm banking on it. Um, I said it first, so. <laughs> Unfortun so. Unfortunately, it's always Jean Hotez, my 90-year-old mother. Right? Oh, I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's just true, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm betting uh, at any rate. Peter, I'm turning the floor over to you. Uh, thanks for being here, and um, it's all yours. Thank you, Scott. It was very, very kind of you to have me back. And uh, I always am so inspired when I come to the Bush School for reasons that I'll uh, talk about in a minute, but uh, especially to come to Texas uh, A&M and see old friends. I don't think you mentioned that I'm also a fellow of the Scowcroft Institute, or did you? What? <laughs> Maybe the most important part. Um, so that's why I've got Scowcroft Institute. And uh, I love working with the group here, the team here. Ms. Uh, and uh, Mr. Natsios, it's uh, tr a truly an, uh, a great honor. Uh, and I was very inspired by the last panel, and uh, it was very thought-provoking, and uh, congratulations uh, on the panel. I'm actually not going to stand behind the podium, because I've learned that someone of my stature over the years, and that when you stand behind the podium, all you see is podium. So I'm going to kind of kind of be out in front here and uh, hopefully uh, interact, and don't f and feel free to engage or uh, ask questions as we go along. So what I'm going to talk about today over the next 30 minutes is uh, not, you, there's been a lot of emphasis the last couple of days about potential pandemic threats. Uh, what I'm going to do is kind of switch gears a little bit and end on what's actually the most, the largest pandemic uh, ever affecting humankind and it's actually ongoing and most people are, are not aware of it. And to tell that story, I'm going to start here, go back 17 years to the launch of the Millennium Development Goals, which were the shared agreed upon goals for uh, sustainable for development and for lifting uh, the poorest people in the world, what some people call the bottom billion out of poverty. And it's had a huge impact. I'm not a big fan of United Nations goals. I think a lot of the times they're forgotten about as quickly as they're drafted. But this one has really stuck and has been providing a framework for the first 15 years of the 21st century, particularly uh, relevant to uh, the, the other Bush, George W. Bush. Uh, the Bush administration, probably more than any other single group, really took Millennium Development Goal number six to heart to combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And this is what led the, the Bush administration to launch uh, Pep, PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which is still ongoing, is still going strong. Anybody know what PEPFAR is funded to now? Anybody want to guess? You're paying for it. So you should. <laughs> it's about $8 billion. Uh, so it's a substantial amount of money to put people on, uh, on antiretroviral drugs uh, to interrupt the AIDS transmission. It also created the President's Malaria Initiative, uh, headed by Ad Admiral Zemer, who was, was here. And, uh, which is also funded through a substantial amount, an incredible accomplishment to improve global health. Now it all came out of uh, the Bush administration. There uh, was another piece to that, though, that people kind of forgot about. Somebody had the brilliant idea when they launched Millennium Development Goal Number 6 to call something other diseases. And believe it or not, 
that did not create a lot of advocacy uh, and, and excitement. Uh, you, you, you didn't see Bono and uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina back when they were still talking. They were talking about AIDS and malaria, but they, no, but they weren't standing up there saying other diseases. And so, so what happened was uh, a group of us, I see myself uh, and two colleagues from the UK, David Molyneux in Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, Alan Fennick in Imperial College London, got together and did a branding exercise to label these diseases the neglected tropical diseases. And uh, they refer to, and I'll show you the list in a minute, they refer to 13 or 14 infections that are highly prevalent among the poor. Uh, they're actually ancient afflictions that have affected humankind for centuries. And very importantly, they tend to be chronic and disabling conditions, almost resembling non-communicable diseases. But they have this very important effect on that bottom bullet point there, poverty promoting, because they shave IQ points off of kids, make people too sick to go to work. They actually not only occur in the setting of poverty, and they trap people in poverty. So uh, the three of us, or my two colleagues from the UK and myself, were laboring on these diseases for years. And when we saw Millennium Development Goal number six, we said, oh my god, what do you do with something called other diseases? So uh, we started going out and doing a branding exercise, labeling them the NTDs. I even wrote a book. Uh, about uh, those diseases, which my kids, would, as only loving kids would do, we call Dad's Forgotten Book on Forgotten People with Forgotten Diseases. <laughs> but it's gone into its second edition. It's been translated in, in Japanese now. So this is the, the new list of the, the, from the latest information from the Global Burden of Disease Study 2016. It basically, what I'm trying to show you here is shock and awe, meaning the, that every single person living in extreme poverty has at least one of these diseases. And more often than not, a single individual who lives in poverty won't just have ascoriasis, they'll have trichuriasis and schistosomiasis. The bottom line is here's the list uh, that was expanded from our original list by the World Health Organization of 20 diseases. Every single person living in poverty has at least one of these uh, uh, afflictions. And uh, what we did was we wrote about this in two back-to-back -back papers in the Public Library of Science. And they kind of stopped there because, you know, as academics, what do we do? As academics, we, at this time, I was chair of microbiology at George Washington University. We write a paper so we can, what, to get a grant, right? And we, why do we get the grant? We get the grant so we can write more papers. And why do we write more papers so we can get the grant so we can write more papers? But the problem is we w wanted to actually really launched this idea that we could combine the top seven of those diseases and target them in a package of medicines which would be donated by the pharmaceutical industry. And we could do this for 40 cents a person per year. And I think this is an important, uh, I'm really glad you made the point about young people because I think this is an important message that if you're willing the time, willing to take the time as a scientist to go through a process of public engagement people will listen. Uh, we tend not to do that because we're so fixed on our papers and our grants and our papers and our grants. But if you take the time, you can have a big impact. And uh, what I started to do was, while I was at George Washington, I started going to a taxi and go to the executive office building of the White House or congressional offices and work with people like uh, Mark Dybul and um, Tommy Thompson, Secretary Thompson then. And believe it or not, these people are accessible and you can go see them and not get arrested. You can actually uh, have, have a conversation. We were able to do that. Uh, I think in part because the Bush administration at that time was so uh, uh, excited about what, launching PEPFAR and its potential impact that they were looking around for another uh, big global health program. And here, uh, the International Business Times. Uh, and this was actually, the other reason it worked was it was actually a time when Republicans actually spoke to Democrats and Democrats actually spoke to Republicans. So you could, it wasn't, things weren't as horribly polarized as they are now. And so we could, you know, work with the Clinton Global Initiative and work with the Bush White House uh, both at the same time. And uh, the International Business Times wrote this interesting article about us, how three scientists market, and it really was a marketing exercise, neglected tropical diseases and raised uh, more than a billion dollars, all going through USAID. And so the USAID uh, program has now uh, been in effect for 10 years. And with the Global Burden of Disease Study now, we've just now evaluated the impact of this program. And the numbers are, are pretty impressive. These are the seven diseases targeted by the package. And now uh, we've seen about a, a the, the, we're doing the worst with hookworm, 
on, on the bottom, but for others, we're getting a, a 30 to 44 percent reduction in the prevalence and disability of these diseases. All, basically, the bottom line is a scientist being able to step out of the lab and being to focus on public engagement, you can make a huge impact. And that's why it's so important for uh, science to be discussed at a pla place like the Scowcroft Institute. We can have all the greatest discussions in the world at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital, but it takes a place like this to help bring it uh, to, to the forefront. So that's where we're at right now. We've made a big impact to this mass drug administration, but in, the, in between the world has changed. The Millennium Development Goals have ended. We've now got a new set of global goals called the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, we have brand new leadership, right? We have a new US president, we have a new UK prime minister, new WHO secretary general, UN general secretary. And what we're seeing now is a change. And so and, and the, what I want to kind of shift gears about is to tell you, I think we're playing a little bit of a game of what I call global health whack-a-mole. And by that, you know, the kids game, you know, where the or the arcade game where the little head pops up and you knock it down and you think you've, uh, you, that's very satisfying to knock down the head, but then the other head pops up. And that's where we're kind of looking at now with neglected tropical diseases. So just as we're about to congratulate ourselves on this USAID NTD program and its great success, we're starting to see rise of a new crop of these neglected diseases. And I don't entirely know what the basis of it is, but uh, this is one idea I'd like to throw out that it's in part because of geopolitical forces uh, together with climate change. And it's uh, kind of in that fact that I don't know for sure that we're entering a new world order, but I think we might be. So the term new world order, as many people in this room know better, far better than I do, has been used to refer to any new period of history, evidencing a dramatic change in world political thought and the balance of power. It refers to the rise of the League of Nations out in the aftermath of World War I the United Nations after World War II and the Cold War. Uh, I can't prove we're in a new world order, but we're seeing some curious trends, Not all of them not good. We're seeing a rise in anti-science globally, uh, the rise of regional conflicts, climate change, this retreat from globalization, both by the US and, and the UK governments uh, with Brexit. Uh, the, people mentioned the uh, China's uh, Belt and Roads Initiative, this Neo Silk Road Initiative, which is very important. And this concept I'll get to is blue marble health. So I'd like to kind of switch gears and tell you how I think all these geopolitical forces are moving together to shape the rise of these new diseases. And I'm going to focus on three, three major forces, three major drivers. And they might surprise you as the big drivers of these neglected tropical diseases. They include political instability and conflict, uh, a shift in global poverty, and very important uh, climate change. And I'm going to kind of, because of the time, I'm going to kind of emphasize uh, the first uh, two. So what about conflict? Well, when we did the analysis of where we're at today with neglected tropical diseases, one of the surprising things is when we looked at the highest prevalence rate of where these diseases are, the 20 diseases now identified as NTDs, neglected tropical diseases by WHO, wherever you see the red, those are conflict and post-conflict countries. So conflict appears to be a major driver now for these new neglected tropical diseases. And I say new, I mean the ones other than the seven. So for instance, what's happening now in the ISIS-occupied areas of Syria, Iraq, and Libya, together with Yemen, is it's not being well publicized, but we're seeing an explosion of disease. The recurrence of measles and polio, uh, leishmaniasis, more than 100,000 cases last year, schistosomiasis, and it, of course a lot of it has to do with the collapse in health system infrastructure that's allowing these diseases to take hold. But also very relevant to One World Health or One Health is the breakdown in international borders as animals are being trafficked. We're seeing brucellosis and Rift Valley fever, um, MERS coronavirus infection, malaria and, and tuberculosis. This is where I think the next Ebola is coming from. It won't be Ebola, but it's going to be something uh, equally horrible that we're already starting to see. So we're, let me give you an example. This is one of the diseases we're working on. The locals call it Aleppo evil, otherwise known as cutaneous leishmaniasis. Uh, we just got new Department of Defense funding to make a vaccine for this. Uh, this is not a killer disease, but like many of the neglected tropical diseases, it's highly disfiguring. Uh, so it's caused by the bite of a sandfly that injects a parasite into the skin and causes this terrible disfigurement. Uh, and you can imagine if you're a little girl or you're a young woman, 
uh, this will render you uh, unmarriageable or grounds for spousal abandonment. So like many of the stigmatizing neglected tropical diseases, it's disproportionately affecting girls and women. This is what's happening across the Middle East uh, Central and Central Asia. Uh, in East Africa, another variant of leishmaniasis that attacks the bone marrow and causes a leukemia-like illness. We're seeing thousands and thousands of cases now of this disease, Kalazar, as they call it, in South Sudan, moving into Ethiopia and other parts of uh, East Africa. And now with the collapse in Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela, more than 20 years ago, led South America in terms of its uh, ability to control its endemic diseases. And now with the collapse, we're seeing the rise of Chagas disease, leishmaniasis, urban schistosomiasis, malaria, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. And this will ignite epidemics uh, across uh, the Americas. So conflict is a major driver. The other thing we did is rather than just looking at prevalence rates, we also looked at the countries with the largest number of neglected tropical diseases. And we also got quite an interesting result that was a counter, kind of a counterintuitive. And it's the subject of my second forgotten book um, called Blue Marble Health, which, which just came out by Johns Hopkins Press. And it takes a minute to explain. Today, if you look at the world's neglected tropical diseases, yes, they're found in devastated areas of sub-Saharan Africa. But on a numbers basis, the largest number of people live today living with a neglected tropical disease live in a G20 economy, a group of 20 economy. Now you might say, well, how can that be? If these are poverty-related diseases, why would they be in the G20 economies? Well, it's the poor living among the wealthy, or what I sometimes call the poorest of the rich, that account now for most of the world's neglected diseases. So uh, most of the world's helminth infections, leishmaniasis, leishmaniasis tuberculosis, dengue, Chagas disease, leprosy, and the list goes on. And what I'm trying to show you uh, on this map here is to say it's not your father's global health anymore, your mother's global health. You know, where we talk about developing versus developed. All economies are rising, but they're leaving behind a bottom segment of society. And this is what's accounting for the world's uh, neglected tropical disease. But they concentrate in focal areas of poverty and disease. So you go into Brazil, and to, you know, you don't, if you look in northeastern Brazil, where, such as Recife and Salvador de Bahia. This is where Zika arose, but it's also where you find schistosomiasis and Chagas disease and leishmaniasis and leprosy. Or if you go into China, you get away from Shanghai and, and Beijing on the eastern part of China, go into southwest China, into Sichuan, Yunnan, uh, uh, Guizhou provinces. There you see this rise in neglected tropical diseases. Anybody concerned about this? Yeah, so do we have poor people in the US? How many poor people do we have in the US? We have 20 million Americans that live at half the US poverty line. And one, according to the Uni University of Michigan Center for Poverty, we have 1.65 million families that live on less than $2 a, a, a day. So, uh, and it's particularly focused uh, along the Gulf Coast states, Texas, Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, and Florida. And so we now estimate that in the Gulf Coast states, there's about 3 million Americans living with the neglected tropical diseases, such as uh, toxicoriasis, uh, as well as Chagas disease, uh, cystocercosis. And Dr. Girard has promised me as soon as he's confirmed, this is going to be the first thing he takes on the neglected diseases of poverty uh, along the Gulf Coast. What's really curious about this, again, this is one example where I've totally failed in advocacy. Uh, you know, I thought with all the success we had in getting packages of interventions out for sub-Saharan Africa and reaching a billion people, hell, now that we found all these neglected tropical diseases among the poor on the Gulf Coast, this is going to be a piece of cake. And quite the opposite has happened. Uh, it's generated zero interest. Nobody seems to care. And, and I'm not quite sure what's going on. I think there is part of it maybe this flyover nation concept. You know, this book uh, that was written a couple of years ago that said the media and everyone is very concerned about what happens in Brookline, Massachusetts, and Westchester, New York, and Bethesda, Maryland, the suburbs of the big East Coast cities and the West Coast. Nobody cares much what happens in the middle. And I think th there may be uh, some truth to that. So what are we doing about it? So we're very interested in vaccines for uh, neglected diseases. And we heard some eloquent statements uh, about the need for vaccines for pandemic threats. Uh, I'm going to use a quote from David Letterman, who I think says it be said it best in 2014. He said, Pepsi has a new Doritos-flavored Mountain Dew. 
no, we don't have an Ebola vaccine, but we do have the Doritos flavored Mountain Dew. What did he mean by that? Well, this was happening, he said this in 2014, when things were looking very dire in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. There was concern about Ebola going to uh, Nigeria. In fact, as was pointed out, the technology to make an Ebola vaccine had been published by Gary Nabel's group at the NIH in 2003, but it sat there. Why did it sit there? Well, how do we, what's our model for how discoveries in, in, in academia are made into products? What happens is a scientist at Texas A&M will make a discovery. The licensing office of Texas A&M will then uh, work with pharmaceutical companies and biotechs to license it to actually get it manufactured into a product. There were no takers in 2003 for an Ebola vaccine. Why was that? No market. So the technology sat there. Finally, things were looking pretty bad in 2014, and I'm sure some of the people in, the, in this room were involved in getting money appropriated through BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority, around $100 million, and then Merck, GlaxoSmithKline, Crucell came in. They did an amazing job turning it around and getting clinical testing underway in West Africa, and of course, by the time clinical testing was underway, the U.S. Army had come in and other interventions uh, put in some semblance of a health system, and Ebola has vanished, and then 11,000 people died who didn't need to die. So uh, this is where this idea of CEPI came along, this Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, that this won't happen again, so we can launch this global fund for vaccines. And, and it's wonderful what, what's happening, and it's by no means a criticism, but when you look at the initial round of targets by CEPI, what are they, Lassa fever, Nipah, and, uh, uh, and MERS coronavirus infection? Those are the three targets. What's that? And I said Nipah, uh, you, uh, I'm sorry, Nipah, loss of fever, and, and, uh, and MERS coronavirus infection. How many people have those diseases right now? Just round off. What? How many, how many people globally have those diseases? When you, when you round off, it's about zero right now, right? That's <laughs> close, close to zero. Um, now, now, I understand these are important pandemic threats, but the point is there's nobody, we're still leaving out the most common afflictions of people who live in poverty. And, and so we're trying to take on these very difficult disease targets of the neglected tropical diseases. And uh, we set up in, in Houston uh, about seven years ago what my kids called Dad's Guaranteed Money Losing Company, um, which, is make, which is actually a nonprofit making vaccines uh, for these diseases. And our approach is to um, try to look at the success that GlaxoSmithKline and Novartis recently had with licensing Bexero, which is the first vaccine made through reverse vaccinology, where they looked at the genome, cherry-picked the genome, did high-throughput bacterial expression, showed antibody, recognized the bacterial surface, down-selected those antigens, picked the ones that were bactericidal. It was very elegant, a beautiful synthesis done uh, led by uh, a guy by the name of Reno Rapuoli at, at GSK and Novartis. We're having trouble reproducing that because we're dealing with complex eukaryotic parasites that have large genomes similar in complexity to the human genome. We oftentimes cannot use bacterial expression system because we get a barren folding. We have to do eukaryotic expression, so it's low throughput, not high throughput, and deficiencies in animal models. That's why for us it's still a holy grail. But we've made some progress. We have. Uh, a couple of uh, exciting uh, vaccines now in phase one trials uh, for both schistosomiasis and hookworm. Uh, the schistosomiasis vaccine was discovered through a, a moderate uh, uh, throughput immunomics approach using sera, panning sera from putatively resistant patients against our panel of uh, surface uh, proteins, and we were able to identify one on the surface of the schistosome that's now gone into phase one trials. We have a hookworm vaccine in phase one trials. The big problem that we're facing is after doing this for a couple of decades, we've gotten very good in the nonprofit sector going from discovery through process development, through manufacture, through IND filing, uh, getting the phase one studies completed, but then we get stuck. Why do we get stuck? No money, right. So, so the problem that you get into is you move towards the advanced development moving to phase three trials, not only just advanced clinical trials, but also, you know, we're making pilot scale material for phase one trials under GMP, but now when you want to move towards industrial scale processes, it gets a lot more expensive. So the problem is, 
We don't have the business model figured out. So this is another reason why it's so important to come to a university like Texas A&M. I could talk to the, the, we do have scientific challenges, but our most formidable uh, hurdles are not scientific. There, we don't have the, the legal system and the business infrastructure. And this is why we need business schools and law schools and why we need uh, Texas A&M University, or, uh, universities like it to help us out. We have a uh, Chagas disease vaccine that's also under development here. We're partnering with the Japanese company ASI to uh, advance uh, this vaccine, which requires high levels of T cell immunity. So it's kind of a different approach, but we've gotten very, we've, I think we're close to solving the mouse Chagas problem. Now if we can get the support to go into the, the, the human situation, we've got a vaccine that seems to prevent the fibrosis in the heart. So this is the leading, one of the leading causes of heart diseases among the poor in Latin America. Almost 10 million people have it and about a million people with Chagasa cardiomyopathy and 40,000 people will die this year uh, because there's no intervention that works. We think we have a good approach to this. And we have a leishmaniasis vaccine that we're working on uh, uh, jointly uh, with the NIH. And now we've been partnering with uh, disease endemic countries in the Middle East. And I did this, I began this collaboration. Uh, I served as US science envoy uh, in the last two years of the Obama administration where uh, he sent me to uh, different uh, parts of Muslim majority countries in the Middle East and we cre created this wonderful collaboration with the Saudis. The idea being through what I call vaccine diplomacy, it's not just what vaccines we make, but how we make it because there's very little vaccine development capacity in places like the Middle East despite uh, all of the, the wealth there, they still have underachieved in terms of their ability to make vaccines. We're trying not to bring them up to speed. So we have a cohort of Saudi scientists and our lab will build a parallel infrastructure. So maybe the leishmaniasis vaccine will get built uh, in, in Saudi Arabia and we we'll also have a MERS coronavirus vaccine as well. The other formidable hurdle that we're facing besides the lack of a, a business, strong business model is the a rise in anti-science. Uh, this is the newest book that's circulating around, Melanie's Marvelous Measles, that purports that measles is a good thing and it, it taps into your natural immunity and ignores the fact that prior to Gavi, 900,000 uh, children died every year of measles. Almost a million children died of measles. Uh, they call me the boy who cried wolf because the anti-vaxxers because I'm exaggerating the impact of measles. And I've turned that around a little bit and said, I think it's partly our fault as scientists, again, that we're so inward looking that we're not out there. And my evidence for this are a couple of things. One, this is a great survey recently completed by Research America, which is a very nice policy group based in DC, that found that 81% of, of Americans cannot name a living scientist. Um, uh, Bill Nye was at the top of the list. Uh, uh, and, and again, I turn around and I say that's, that's our fault. They also found that most Americans, 65% of Americans, cannot name an institution where biomedical research is conducted. Guess how many named Texas A&M? That's right, zero. Uh, guess how many named Baylor College of Medicine? The same, zero. What was the most number one institution where biomedical research is conducted? Anybody want to guess? Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic? Oh, they're good, you know, but I wouldn't call them number one. Number two? Anybody? St. Jude's children. Now Hopkins was, was actually on the list, but, but way down. Um, the, they also, the Pew Foundation has also found that fewer than 20% of American scientists have ever blogged about their research or ever talked about their research on social media. How many of you are on Twitter? See, that's pathetic, you know. So, right, or it doesn't have to be Twitter, any, any kind of social media. But again, this is the fault of our profession, you know, that we uh, don't encourage our scientists uh, to be out there in, in the public. And, and, clearly, and this is why we've had a flatline budget at the NIH for two decades, uh, as well as the NSF. Um, that we, we need to be kind of out there. So the anti-vaccine movement, and I'll end quickly talking about that, seems to have begun in 1998 when this man Andrew Wakefield led a team of scientists at the Royal Free Hospital in London claiming that measles, mumps, rubella vaccine caused uh, autism and uh, invoked this very elaborate uh, mechanism by which that happens by the measles virus operating through the gut. Ultimately, the results were found to be fraudulent. There were conflicts of interest, but it took 12 years for the paper to get retracted. And in the meantime, 
what happened was we saw this dramatic spread of anti-vaccine or anti-vax. My wife says I shouldn't say anti-vax. It's pejorative, but when I'm mad, I say anti-vax anyway. Um, uh, anti-vax sentiment in California, and there was really particularly concentrated two areas of California, Marin County and Orange County, California. What can you say in common about those two counties? Affluent, right. So people who, and educated, people who knew enough to do a Google search and pull up all these vaccine websites, but not enough to realize they were phony anti-vax websites. So they would pull up Barbara Lowe Fisher's National Vaccine Information Center website, which is really the National Vaccine Misinformation website. Uh, and and uh, so finally, uh, what happened was there was a massive measles outbreak in, in Southern California, uh, landed do dozens of kids in the hospital. And finally, the California legislature, at their own peril, said, enough of this. We're going to stop non-medical exemptions for vaccines. And they closed that door. Uh, the, the problem was everybody then moved to Texas uh, after that. And so uh, Andrew Wakefield, who uh, was struck off the register of, for medical license at the UK, uh, where else do you go? You come to Austin, Texas. So he moved to Austin, Texas, and uh, where he's created this and uh, directs this sort of phony pseudoscience documentary, Vaxxed. How many people have seen it? Anybody? It's tough to sit there. Anybody see through the trailer? You can watch the trailer, which you know shows kids uh, on the autism spectrum at their worst and self-destructive. But the voiceover is saying it's caused by vaccines, and then going on to uh, report on this vast conspiracy by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I think, I forget who it was, someone said it beautifully. Even if they wanted to create a conspiracy, as you know, CDC, the, that conspiracy would last all of an afternoon, right? So, uh, so it's, it's, but it's a very compelling, it's a very compelling, uh, convincing movie until you have to sort of shake yourself and realize this is total bullshit. This is all completely uh, made up. But this is going circulating around the country now and circulating uh, on, on, on internationally now, too, trying to export things back in, into Europe. Um, and then, uh, uh, in parallel with that, a new organization's been created called Texans for Vaccine Choice. Do we get the internet here by any chance? Yeah. Let me just uh, show you the Texans for Vaccine Choice website. So here's the website. Um, let me point you a few. First of, all, first of all, what are the colors of the website? Well, it's got the Texas flag over here, red, white, and blue. And what's this over here on the upper right? Your upper right? That's God. That's what God looks like over here. So they've got God on their side. And then, then it's got the baby and the, and the mother. And then what you do is you click on exemptions. And it tells you how, step by step, you can exempt your kid from getting vaccinated for public schools. Fill out request form. How do I do it? Step by step by step. So this is happening now at, um, uh, how do I get back to the slides? Oh yeah, they, you can buy you can buy the T-shirt, you can buy the mug, you can buy. Uh, so this is what's happening. So we've now seen a 20-fold rise in the number of non-medical exemptions. This doesn't even include the homeschooled kids. So we think the number could even be closer to around 100,000. And remember, if that were just evenly spread across the state of Texas, it might not have that big an impact. But it's focal. It's most of it's hap. I mean, there's a few small counties, but it's the big one is are Denton and Austin, Texas, where. Wakefield and uh, Texans for Vaccine Choice are. So we're going to start having measles outbreaks in, in the state of Texas. We're actually going to reverse Millennium Development Goals uh, in, in, in the state of Texas. Uh, Wakefield is also, the team has also gone now, and they're actually preying upon certain, they're being predatory in certain communities. They've gone now into, this is reported by the Washington Post, they've gone into the Somali immigrant community in Minnesota, 
and they dropped down vaccination rates to 40%, and lo and behold, a massive measles outbreak this year landed 20 kids uh, in the hospital with measles. They've now teamed up with Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, are going into poor African-American neighborhoods, and they're calling vaccines the next, next Tuskegee, that it's this kind of experimentation. And you can imagine among the more vulnerable communities where there's crowding and poverty, so it's, it's pretty evil stuff. This is from Heidi Larson at the University of London, who's now seeing that this anti-vaccine sentiment is being exported into France and Italy and Croatia. And the big concern, of course, is what happens when this hits uh, the big low and middle income countries. And it, there's already some evidence that it's happening, but again, it's happening more among the more affluent middle classes in Brazil, India, Nigeria. But you can imagine when that takes off, it's gonna be a catastrophic result. So we started fighting back uh, we wrote papers like this in, in JAMA showing that what's going to happen now uh, as you drop vaccination coverage, how quickly measles uh, will bounce back. And then I made the big mistake of writing this piece in the New York Times where because I have a daughter with autism in the past, I was sort of beneath contempt by the, by the anti-vax community. I went from being beneath contempt to being utterly contemptible. And, uh, and this has really uh, changed my uh, life quite a bit. We have a new paper that we're working on showing the rise in non-medical exemptions in the 18 states that still allow it, uh, and it's, it's going up uh, precipitously. And these are the new anti-vaccine hotspots uh, uh, in the United States right now where, we, where I think where the numbers are, you know, tens of thousands of kids are not being vaccinated. So Austin's on there. Detroit, which I don't quite understand about Detroit, but they're mostly Western states, so Phoenix. A lot of it is... Uh, Portland, Seattle, Spokane, Bo Boise, and they have sort of different flavors in different areas. So in Oregon and Washington, the anti-vaccine movement tends to be more coming from the political left, sort of, I don't know, peace, love, granola. We have to be careful what we put into our kids. In Texas and Phoenix, it has more of a, it's more coming from the political right that it's saying, you know, uh, you can't tell us what to do with our kids, right? I mean, we can tell them to put seatbelts on, and we can tell them to use car seats, and, you know, you have to lock your gun if you have kids in the home, but we can't tell them to, to vaccinate. Uh, their kids are calling it medical freedom. So these are, uh, you can have a good time if you Google my name and anti-vax. You get all sorts of interesting stuff coming up. This, this is one recent one. Peter Hotez wants vaccine mandates a post travel ban to Somalia during Somali, something doesn't make sense to me, during Somali measles outbreak, lives in a sanctuary city, Houston, is Houston a sanctuary? I guess it is. Um, in denial of daughter's vaccine cause autism, uh, Dr. Hota is the boy who cried wolf, and they're sort of ratcheting it up. Uh, so that's me with Rachel. Uh, she's an adult now um, with autism and other pretty severe mental disabilities. So I. Uh, I have a new book that's about to be uh, published by Johns Hopkins Press with the working title, Vaccines Do Not Cause Rachel's Autism. And uh, that's going to make life even more interesting for me. And what I do is point out that not only has there been this rise in the anti-vaccine movement, but I lay out the evidence showing why vaccines don't cause autism. I even take it a step further by talking about lack of plausibility. We've learned so much about the neurobiology of autism, how it begins in the first trimester of pregnancy. It's a prenatal set of uh, processes that change the prefrontal cortex uh, uh, of the brain, that there's a lack of plausibility uh, that, the, that things are ha already happening in place well before kids uh, ever uh, see vaccines. So uh, I'll just end by a quote from Elie Wiesel, who says, man's weakness is not in achieving victories, but in taking advantage of them. Uh, you know, we've res res achieved enormous victories through Gavi, uh, through USAID programs, and rather than uh, you know leveraging that into really eliminating these diseases, instead we're sort of moving backwards for reasons, from my perspective, that don't make a lot of sense. So thank you so much for having just some remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hotez. Um, Allison Winnicky with the Immunization Partnership. Oh, by the way, the Immunization Partnership is, I think I should have mentioned this. I'm, for disclosure, I'm on your board, yes. but it's an amazing nonprofit organization uh, based in Texas that is really going to uh, the state legislature uh, every, every two years 
Um, the, and the Texans for Vaccine Choice is actually the self-described political action committee. So they're raising money, they're lobbying, and um, we don't have a lot of pro-vaccine forces here in the state of Texas, so she's leading one of the really important organizations here. So you mentioned the anti-science sentiment, and I would even sort of expand that to an anti-expert sentiment that we're, we're seeing going on. So we're all experts here. In the last couple of days, we have had amazing discussions. We come from really diverse backgrounds, talking about pandemics. What advice do you have for us to take our message outside of our expert bubble and to the people, to policymakers, especially in light of this, this sentiment where we're seeing a lot of pushback um, and they don't want to hear what we have to say? Yeah, no, I, I often get asked that. How, how, do you, how did I do what I did and how am I doing what I'm doing? Um, the truth is I don't really know. I was never formally trained in public policy uh, or, or in advocacy. And I sometimes think, you know, if I had to do it all over again, it would have been great if I could have spent a year at the Bush School learning actually how to do policy in a more rigorous, uh, formal way. So it's very much seat of the pants, social media, um, We'll be willing to make declarative statements, speak in stark, rather simple terms that we're not usually accustomed to as scientists because that's what's attractive for sound bites and talking to members of the press. They, you know, they don't, we, what, what we do now as experts is we make the press do all the work. We are, provide this very careful, measured response uh, that lasts 20 minutes and you've got a journalist on deadline and they just need the bottom line. And I think we have to be, uh, sort of be willing to go out on a limb more and be able to speak in that sound bite in the bottom line, which oftentimes means going out of your comfort zone because you'll see that stuff appear in print, the next, well, nothing's in print anymore, but appear, appear on a website the next day or on social media and you say, ooh, did I say that? So sometimes you, you cringe a little bit. Yeah, that's what I feel, but I should have said it in more scientific terms. No, I think you have to be willing to, to to make that leap. There's other, uh, under the microphone, you have a question in the interim. I'm going to ask a question. Um, yeah, the discussion on, on the anti-vaccine movement is, um, well, actually, it's very tragic, uh, what's happening and what's happening in, in our communities. Um, but I, you know, I also kind of worry what, what impact it may have just on our larger, say, public health pandemic preparedness when a part of the toolkit for pandemic preparedness may in fact be vaccines and um, manufacturing vaccines for the population and surge manufacturing. Um, is there a potential impact on the political will to actually invest in vaccines for public health preparedness? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, yesterday I put on social media a BBC Two story about a uh, mother and her son, and how proud she is that she did not vaccinate him against flu. And she says she doesn't mind that he gets a little bit of flu, right? She doesn't, you know, how do you explain? You know, flu kills between 3,000 and 50,000 Americans every year on a good year. And, you know, what happens if something really catastrophic? And as, you know, Mike Osterholm might have mentioned in the Southern Hemisphere, looking like this could be a bad uh, flu season. So, um, uh, we've, got our, we've got our challenges, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and it, it, I, it does require the U.S. government, I think, to be more forceful in speaking out. I think, you know, I don't like criticizing our government, so I'll say it in a sort of a mild, gentle way, which is that I think for the last few administrations, going back to the Clinton administration, when Andrew Wakefield stuff came out, the response from Gen General from Health and Human Services, CDC, is to say this is a fringe group Let's ignore them. They're going to go away. Don't give them a platform to engage them. And I think 15 years ago that was true. But I think what's happened is this thing has crept up and grown bigger and bigger. They're no longer a cult. They're no longer a fringe group. They're now part of mainstream America. And now we're going to have to, to do something about that. I mean, from my experience, when you talk to parents who don't vaccinate their kids, 
you know, about 60 to 70 percent are not really dug in. They've heard something unsavory, either from the internet or from friends or family. Uh, but if you take the time to sit down and explain this to them, yeah, they'll vaccinate their kids. So that's where the battleground is. There's about 10 to 20 percent of the anti-vaxxers that are really dug in, that it's part of their personal belief system. And the, the fact that you're trying to talk them out of it means you must be part of the conspiracy. And, and, uh, and there's no way I think you're going to reach those, those groups easily. Right. Yeah. But I think it's important. So, I mean, uh, Secretary Price said something like, well, you know, vac vaccine policy, it's not really appropriate for the federal government to speak out because vaccine policy is done at the state level. That's partly true. Vaccine policy is conducted at the state level. It's the states that make it. But the federal government could have a huge role in, in, in advocacy, uh, yeah, I, I think. Have a, uh, a person who will be the assistant secretary of health and sometimes very repeatedly asks about vaccine policy and says there's a, something that needs to be told about. And that's, 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 that's why I try to buy Brett lunch as often as I can before, <laughs> before I can't buy him lunch anymore. So thanks, Jerry, and thanks, Peter. Uh, I want to make a cut. Of course, every time I, 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 I've gone to 50 of your lectures, and each one of them makes me more inspired and more passionate you, about than they were before. Just two comments. Uh, I'll do the anti-vax one second. The first is, um, over the last few months, while awaiting a vote, I've been very actively busy in understanding that your map of poverty and neglected tropical diseases really maps onto poverty with the exception of uh, Appalachia, North and South Dakota, which probably don't have the permissive climates for ne neglected tropical diseases. But across the board, we spend all our time talking about healthcare, whereas healthcare access is about 10% of public health, as you know, and quality is another 10%. And the social determinants, uh, education, poverty, socioeconomic status, and the behaviors that are associated with that is where we gotta spend our money. And of course, as I said uh, in my uh, is, you know, several times that's going to be a, a, a true focus, uh, hopefully, as we move forward as, as the primary public health advisor to, to the secretary. This, the second point on the anti-vaxxers, um, uh, you know me very well. I'm a pediatrician. I took care of, I had patients die of measles uh, mm -hmm. under my care uh, in, in Dallas. Uh, and in my confirmation hearings, I took your advice and abandoned the scientific uh, well, there's a chance of this and a chance of that, and was very clear, and that was supported by the secretary, uh, that vaccines are the most important public health advance in this century. Right. They do not cause autism, and they're something that we will uh, defend. I know the Surgeon General feels uh, very strongly about that as well. Um, I certainly can't talk for the rest of the administration, but uh, you certainly have it uh, for me that I'm absolutely committed to uh, promoting vaccines, including HPV, uh, which is a prevention uh, of cancer. If anybody told you you could vaccinate against cancer, we have spending all our money doing it while we have a couple of them, mm -hmm. hepatitis B and HPV. Right, right. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. I, I can't speak for the administration because I'm uh, a vote away from being in, in it, but uh, my views were clearly known as well as the Surgeon General's, and we certainly want to be on every one side in here and promoting uh, vaccinations as uh, the most important public health advance, aside from sanitation, of course, of our of our century. And and secondly, we fully understand uh, the impact on pandemics because um, um, if we have the infrastructure to molecularly characterize and diagnose viruses, if we can rapidly make a vaccine and by miracles uh, uh, manufacture it within a seven or eight or 12 week period of time, but no one takes it, it does us no good. Right, right. So uh, we have to complete the entire chain. Brilliantly stated, Brett. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Hotez, uh, Jason Motes from the Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service. Uh, thank you so much uh, for for this great kind of capstone to everything. Uh, I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, I rode on an ambulance a few times and uh, drug fire hose and have spent a lot of time as an emergency manager. What struck me about when you were talking about those 16, 17 diseases and the fact that they fall in the poverty line is that we now have a stew brewing in an island part of this country 
and I'm wondering how how would you take and incorporate the the things that you've talked about this afternoon into the recovery plan for uh, Puerto Rico, which is you know part of our country, uh, or you know into the next big catastrophe that's wiped out by a hurricane. Yeah, I think it's a it's a great point. You know, Puerto Rico uh, has you know if, if Puerto Rico were a state, thank you for that question. If Puerto Rico were a state, it would have the highest poverty rate of any state in the in the U.S. I think it's 44 percent of the population uh, lives below the poverty level. And now you superimpose on that um, climate change, and, and which partly accounts for the severity of, uh, this, of uh, Hurricane Maria. And then you now talk about, a, on top of that, a decimated health care infrastructure. What are we at risk for? We um, Clearly, the diarrheal diseases uh, are going to be at, at great risk. Uh, typhoid, paratyphoid fever, these are pretty serious diseases. There's even a remote possibility that you could see cholera uh, break out in, in Puerto Rico. Then you have with the receding floodwaters, even on a good day, uh, Puerto Rico is ground zero for dengue fever. Uh, and, and they got hit hard by Zika, of course, last year. So we have to believe that there's going to be a big rise in uh, dengue epidemics. There's still a lot of weeks left of dengue season. Uh, in Puerto Rico. So there's going to be, a, you know, putting a health system in place is going to absolutely have to be a priority uh, uh, for that, no question about it. And maybe vaccinating too. Vaccinating against hepatitis, uh, using the Sanofi dengue vaccine, even though there are some, there's some concerns about that, uh, th there are options that we have. Great, thank you. Peter, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. Well, I want to thank everybody that um, was was with us um, for the full two days, and I especially want to thank uh, those who joined us this afternoon and particularly the students who joined this. I think that you can readily see um, that the challenges of pandemic preparedness, uh, neglected tropical diseases, they're huge. And, and again, those of you who are the students who have joined us, there's a lot of room for um, that next generation that's come along. There's gonna be a lot of hard work that you need to do. All of us have a lot of hard work and if you were to ask me, well, what should I do to join into this, be part of the solution? Well, first and foremost, focus, focus on the, the immediate in your academics and getting your degrees done and uh, getting into the uh, specialty training that would propel you in to being part of the solution. All the, there is no shortcut, um, but uh, the, the challenges ahead of us are going to, to um, require um, a growing scientific policy uh, workforce and leadership that's going to need to step forward. So we have talked a lot about leadership in this summit and the need for leadership. We have talked a lot about the need for creative, innovative solutions. But I think uh, underpinning all of that is we need urgent action. And so I'm committed to beating that drum to make sure that we can have urgent action and I know everybody in this room is also committed to beating the drum so we can get urgent action um, to help be part of the solution. So thank you very much for your attendance. Andrew, do you have any, any further thoughts? When we started this initiative at the Scowcroft Institute, several people in the faculty said, we don't have any health experts in the Bush School. Why are you doing this? Uh, this has nothing to do with international relations theory. I said, well, if you go back and look at the 1918 pandemic, it actually killed more people than World War I and World War II. And it had more catastrophic consequences, even though they were not as visible in an international relations textbook. Uh, because we know this is going to happen, we do know what the consequence is going to be. It's going to disrupt the global economic order on a dramatic scale. 
it will, could collapse the, the world economy. And I don't want to be too apocalyptic here, but it, we know what's going to happen because we saw a little tiny bit of this with respect to SARS. It, the damage it did to the Canadian economy has been documented. The damage that was done by MERS to the South Korean economy has been documented. And that's just tiny compared to what's going to happen when we have an outbreak of the flu. It's probably going to be the flu that mutates, that has what they call a high R0 factor, and then it spreads rapidly. Just to repeat the statistic that I mentioned yesterday, 1.8 billion people, this is from my good friend Dennis Carroll from USAID, he told, I didn't believe him, I, I believed him, but I was a little skeptical. He told me this. I read it and I said, this can't, he must have made a mistake, maybe he meant million, not billion. 1.8 billion people got the flu when the pandemic started in 2009. The only reason we didn't have a repetition of 1918 is because it n did not mutate to a high mortality rate. It's just a matter of time when that happens. A, a disease gets to, to 1.8 million people in six months? That in and of itself should be a warning sign here. So the reason we, and I asked General Scowcroft, are you upset that we're doing a health issue within your institute? He said, Andrew, I wish I had thought of this. He said, and I said, well, maybe we should move it to, he said, don't move it, I want it in my institute. Interesting. And General Scowcroft's name is so well regarded now, and increasingly, and as President Bush 41's name is highly regarded. His new book, by the way, I encourage you to come on day after Thanksgiving weekend, because um, Jeff Engel is going to um, present on his new book on uh, George Bush and the end of the Cold War. But, and, but Scowcroft said, you, you know, use my name to make this a national issue. And our expertise here is not in science. That's why we have Jerry Parker, that's why we have P Peter Hotez and Jerry Parker, are both senior fellows of the Scowcroft Institute. Uh, the reason they're senior, because we need scientists, but we also need people who understand how to make public policy. That is my area. So thank you all for coming. We, this is our third annual uh, pandemic conference. We will have one next year as well. Thank you all very much.